Okay, good morning. It's Thursday, March 3rd. We got a uh, interesting open session. We'll have the uh, first uh, part of the Siegel study uh, discussion and brief to us from the Siegel team uh, in just a little bit. But as always, let's um, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and take a moment of silence and in solidarity with uh, the Ukrainians' challenges, uh, keep them in our thoughts and prayers. Um, we're, we're talking over a million refugees at this point. And now Lviv, where their border crossing is, is starting to get hit. So let's just keep them uh, in our thoughts and prayers. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, And I guess I should have prefaced it that that's what I was going to be doing in my thoughts. Um, so it's just, uh, it's been a tough week for the world right now. But, uh, but let's move it into Carroll County and go with Priority Carroll, Commissioner Frazier. Well, I was not going to say anything about the groundbreaking up at Charles Carroll. I think Commissioner Wayne's going to take that. We were all there for that. It was a good... Um, groundbreaking finally coming about with long last and uh, we all also were all there for the meeting with the city of Westminster and their council and so forth we shared some projects that they have uh, upcoming I think will benefit both the county and the city and uh, you know it's, it's also good that we're working closely together with them and as we try to work with all our municipalities I think it's just something that this this board has really worked on and the last board as well trying to work closely with the municipalities because whatever is good for them and you generally is good for the county so why shouldn't we work with them and I'll just stop leave it at that and move on okay Commissioner Wentz okay good morning uh, it's been a while since we've been on this desk so uh, had the state of the county address and want to thank everybody that uh, participated in that very well received and uh, the rest of the day it's always it's always uh, a good time to meet with a leadership Carroll class. There's some really bright young people uh, that are part of that class, so I want to thank them for that. The chamber specifically for putting that together. Last one that I will do, and a couple others. So uh, anyway, it was uh, very good, and I appreciate everything that went on that day. Uh, I had the opportunity to tour one of our uh, businesses here in the county, and it's interesting to me because. Um, the owner of, of the business had an interesting statement that he said to me. He said, you know, we, we see all, the, all the, the politicians come and use the big scissors and cut the ribbons, and then we never see them much after that. So uh, I was kind of glad that we re-engaged with FR Conversions out of the air park, uh, the business park. Uh, and I guess my message to everybody is let's not forget the businesses after uh, we have the elbow rubbing uh, ceremonies because they're doing some amazing things. Uh, I took uh, some staff out there and um, FR Conversions, as you probably remember, started building uh, handicapped accessible uh, units to put into vans. Uh, and they do it from the ground up. The only thing they get is the chassis from where whatever, most a lot of it's Chrysler. Uh, but they've now started to build ambulances and they're shipping ambulances all over the world. And it was, I'm, I'm telling you, my, my, I've, I've walked around that place with my mouth open the whole time as to what they are accomplishing right out here. And they, it's, they're, they're building everything there. Uh, from all of the units inside the ambulance to the light bars to the sirens it's all happening right out here so if you get a chance they would love to have people tour their facility and uh, I, I encourage everyone to stay engaged with those businesses that come into our county and don't just forget about them after that first day of, of ribbon cutting because uh, 
you know, the biggest thing also is the, is the uh, employment opportunities out there. Man, they, they, they've got some really good employees out there. So it was very interesting. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience, and I appreciate uh, the folks at FR Conversions for providing the opportunity for a nice tour out there. Uh, we're going to hear from Mike Fowler. It's all things legislative now. Uh, one thing I will say, we spent a little time, and I don't know if you were going to touch on this, the election board. Uh, so let me just briefly touch on that. As most of you know, there are a lot of lawsuits that could and have already affected the um, the uh, the schedule for this election for this year. Uh, there's a lawsuit in Prince George's County. There's a lawsuit in Baltimore County. There are four lawsuits in the uh, through the General Assembly in the Court of Appeals. There are three congressional lawsuits. Uh, I guess that's the way of the world now. When somebody gets angry, let's go find Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Uh, that great lawyer firm. That's what everybody does. I've seen it occur here in local government. You know, well, I, you don't, I don't like that, so I'm going to get a lawyer. <laughs> Let me get off that soapbox, but that's just absurd to me. Um, but anyway, all of these are taking place. He's already uh, registering as a candidate, has been pushed back to March the 22nd. Uh, and now there is a rumor that Possibly, it could push the election into August, uh, and we'll see the primary. The primary. primary. Uh, so we'll see what happens. That's just a rumor right now. Uh, but there are a lot of things going on uh, when it comes to elections. We had uh, a briefing by Linda, Lamont, uh, Linda Lamone, who is the uh, state uh, administrator for the Maryland State Board of Elections. And what resonated with me after she got done her report to all, all of us on the MACO call yesterday was um, you might want to give your local election board folks a hug when you see them because they truly need it. They're, um, they're going through some tough times. So we'll see where that goes. I only brought that up just to advise people that uh, it looks like it's going to be a very interesting election season, not only because of the things that will occur as a result of typical elections, but because of the delay now uh, with uh, all the lawsuits. So, I should warn you: if you give an election board member a hug, they may run to a lawyer. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Valid point. I was the same thing. <laughs> yeah, nothing against attorneys, because you know, I, God bless them, because man, they got plenty of business these days. Because I think if you look at somebody the wrong way, they might get an attorney. That's or a have. doctor. That's all I have. <laughs> okay, uh, just a little bit to piggyback on Commissioner Wance. Uh, you know, the state of the county, if you heard one thing in the state of the county, we're in good shape in this county. We really are unique. And you look at the issues, whether it's the state suing somebody or whatever, Carroll County, uh, I guess, I think things are doing very well. And I look at things, is it better than when we took office? Have we made a difference? And I think if you look at that, I think we've made a positive difference in the county. I don't see it. It didn't go the other way. So that is a positive here in Carroll. I firmly believe that. I just left the uh, ag breakfast here at uh, uh, Balkers this morning, and man, it was really refreshing to be out with a, a group out here that just wanted to know what, exactly what's going on uh, in the county, uh, asking questions. It was kind of a mini uh, state of the county at that point. Um, and uh, I want to just reiterate that Charles Carroll groundbreaking uh, was a fantastic event. Yeah, Commissioner I'm coming back, to that. I'm coming back we'll, to that. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll okay. Back. We're going to circle the wagons back. Okay. Uh, anyway. That wagon. That wagon? Kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, I was going to say Commissioner Wance did a good job, but forget it. Um, <laughs> and it uh, Don't know if we're exaggerating. The uh, North Carroll and uh, Charles Carroll both have been, uh, I think, uh, now on their way to doing something productive for the community. Even though it's taken years, we finally got through that. And the other last thing I want to say, the meeting with the City of Westminster, uh, very positive, and communication uh, no matter what we do, I think it's the key. We've met with the town of Mount Area as a group. We've met with Westminster. 
all of a sudden we start working together to solve uh, issues or any problems, that is extremely important for the Board of County Commissioners. And uh, this communication and keeping it open, uh, whether it's us individually, whether it's meeting with municipalities, or whether meeting with just uh, our friends and neighbors out here, uh, citizens, communication is extremely important. And I think uh, w here again, as a board, we're doing things uh, I'm not sure happens in all counties. So. I'm no, I, I appreciate that, and uh, it does segue back into uh, Commissioner Wentz for a minute. Um, really appreciate the selflessness, persistence, perseverance of both Commissioner Weaver and Commissioner Wentz, colleagues that have focused attention on the community, and I'll continue to say it, I just don't understand the word constituents when we're a board of commissioners. We're talking about neighbors, friends, family, and community. So. That's how I feel and will always feel, and their dedication to North Carroll High School and to Charles Carroll Community Center is about community. So, uh, Steve, if really appreciate uh, your efforts, but uh, it was highlighted yesterday. So, well, I appreciate that, Ed. Uh, and yeah, sir, I got I got on a high horse with the redistricting maps <laughs> and the lawsuits, but. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Uh, my, 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 my theme here, and similar to what you said, Ed, has been uh, people before politics. And I said that when I ran for this office. And I continue that uh, as well. So uh, the Charles Carroll uh, situation, I mean, the, the three schools in general were, were hard for us. Yeah. Uh, the three of us remember those difficult times that we didn't sleep for uh, you know, quite a few nights. And um, I will, before I touch on this, I want to congratulate you as well, Commissioner Weaver, as Ed said, because you've, uh, you've seen the hard times up there, and I think we're going to have a great community venue now on that side of the county, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. And uh, New Windsor's being leased. And then finally, uh, this situation where the school was completely torn down and left a hole up there in the community, pun intended. Uh, so through hard work and not just by me but by staff uh, from budget to DPW to, to I mean everybody I mean we, we had we had a little battle with SHA for a while as you remember and, and uh, we came out on that uh, side of it really well but uh, I'm excited to say that this uh, this is project will, will begin very shortly now and um, that community will have something that they can call home. And uh, there was a lot of pushback. Uh, well, not a lot, but there was a good deal of pushback from a lot of different people. Uh, but um, I'm not going to get on that. I just, Fair I, it, it just, it, that's what occurs. But uh, we, we worked our way through it, and uh, we're going to have a great 13,000 square foot building up there for not only that community, but as you say, Ed, uh, it'll serve the county. And surrounding areas because uh, the full-size gymnasium and the meeting rooms will provide the opportunity for everyone uh, beyond Silver Running Mini Mills to uh, take advantage of a nice meeting place and recreational venue uh, and I'm sure they'll come from all parts of the county so again I want to thank everybody um, there's Derek Ludlow who was our community liaison uh, so uh, did anybody get dirt on their shoes at the <laughs> just, just, you know, a sprinkling. Is that all okay? Because that's usually the thing. So I splash. I don't understand. Did? Okay. I, yeah. Okay. So to my colleagues, thank you as well. Uh, I, I truly appreciate uh, <coughs> your assistance. And there were some hard decisions. And I, I appreciate it. To, to, I appreciate all you guys as well. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Boucher. Thank you. Commissioner Wentz, I appreciate you mentioning the manufacturing base and business community in this county because on average, employees in manufacturing make more money than people in retail and other sectors. So highlighting the importance of manufacturing locally is really important. I did a tour out there at Winfield. Staff there showed me the pumping system for the wastewater management system they'll be replacing. That's always nice to go out and see what they're up to. It's a constant, continuous process to maintain all this equipment. There's so many things and in infrastructure that go on that we don't see, and these individuals stay active 24-7.
making sure that all those needs of water and sewer are provided for us. So thank you very much. What else do we have? Oh, then by chance, I went out and did the tour of the Winfield Salt Dome the evening of the ice storm that was coming. So I had a big crew there to give me a tour of everything. I did not realize that the trailers there have bunk bed systems for the drivers that they're on 24 hours or 48 hours. And I think there's a regulation with State Highway Administration every so many hours I can't drive. So we have very nice facilities for them, for their safety and well-being. And what a wonderful crew. So many of us can cuddle up on our couch and watch TV during a snowstorm. And these individuals that work for the county are out there for 24 hours straight. Here's a, a view of the new salt dome we have. This is also up on our roof. We're refurbishing the roof structure. They redid all the, uh, the metal work, the new paneling. They're redoing the roof. And this is her crew up there, um, Deputy Director Green. A lot of credit goes to these individuals who go out and look at these things that most of us have no idea what's going on. And if we don't maintain this, then there's a, a much larger long-term cost to us. So thanks to all those individuals who have been working on refurbing this building and making sure it lasts a long time. And finally, I believe this, we have South Carroll once again is doing tremendous work in athletics and in track and field. Thanks to their athletic director, Timothy Novotny, I received some information we have here. I'll list off themes. The women's four times 400 1A state championships. These are our, our first place winners, Lauren Chesney, Madeline Boyce, Brooklyn Fry Bulick, Ella Boyce, and then we have in the Williams 500 1A state championships, Madeline Boyce, men's pole vault 1A state championship, Peyton Thomas, men's shot put 1A state championships, Nathaniel Fields, and a lot of credit goes out to their coaching staff. I like to list them. That's Caitlin Weinholt, Joe Murray, Zachary Brown, Vicki Pelicotti. I'm sorry if I'm slaughtering the name, but a special thanks to all those coaches because without a good coaching staff, as Commissioner Frazier well knows, we will not have these young champions out there. So thank you for representing Carroll County. I think that'll be it. So thank you. Okay, as uh, I shared earlier, you know, we have a, a very big world out there, but a small community. And um, just keep Ukraine in our thoughts. Uh, blue and gold, but just more than that, um, understanding, you know, the impact that it's going to have because it ain't over and it's going to be a long time before it is over. Uh, so that's honestly what's front on my mind. Uh, what was shared was uh, the state of the county. The focus I appreciate was on our community, was on safety, security, quality of uh, life for um, Carroll County, and nobody knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans. Uh, our um, role as commissioners in participating within the commissions and councils uh, is second to none across the state and it makes those commissions and councils the best there are from the Veterans Advisory Council which has been recognized to the Ag Council or Commission to uh, all of them uh, aging dis, uh, disabilities um, we take care of Carroll County because of our impact that we have from uh, from our board in participation and understanding because we don't do it all up here and we can't expect to do it all. So having the eyes and ears out there and then participating, um, you know, is really been a valuable uh, opportunity for all of us. We had a joint board of education meeting recently, um, lasted about an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, so a little bit less time than their their typical meetings but that's okay uh, we got a lot covered um, in that joint meeting uh, and a lot of discussion and crosstalk uh, between CCPS Board of Education and us as the Board of County Commissioners on uh, working a path forward it's definitely going to be challenging times as we're going to be walking ourselves into the budget season in just the next couple of weeks where we'll really be uh, eyes down and figuring out how best uh, to resource the needs of our um, our children and our school system so uh, that is 
I think, high on everybody's agenda. The last thing I, I do want to share again, it's important for outreach and the developers um, that have, have that have been identified that have um, purchased, I guess, the properties down in South Carroll, both in two very large residential properties, the Beatty property and the Zabel property, uh, have been invited and look forward to engaging with the community during my town hall on Wednesday. Typically, as typical, I have uh, town hall meetings, one in the morning, one in the evening, to do the best I can in getting outreach to the community because, you know, one time suits people better than another time. But I do have both uh, developers coming to those town halls to answer your questions. Um, and I'll also have, uh, as always, key staff there in attendance along with our uh, sheriff's department um, to answer your questions as well. But I do look forward to, uh, you know, the developers, you know, outreach. And uh, I applaud them for uh, wanting to do that because there's gonna be some tough questions I would expect. But uh, if you got it, I'll tell you, it ain't the place, social media is not the place to do it. It's uh, outreach to us. Um, you know, if uh, I see something on social media, I typically say, here's my email, reach out, and let me help answer that question. Um, as opposed to the circling of social media comments, which a word from Commissioner Wance's vocabulary is absurd and does us absolutely no good. So, um, but what does us good is our liaison legislative liaison, Mr. Mike Fowler. So without further ado, Mike, why don't you uh, share with us what is happening in the wonderful town of Annapolis? Annapolis. Yes, well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So 40 days remaining, a little over a month, um, and halfway there, a little more than halfway there. Uh, the big date, I think, is March 31st, crossover date, so a lot of work to be done this month. Uh, yesterday, Commissioner Wentz and Commissioner Frazier were uh, on the MAKO call, which discussed the issues around the election. And the, the only thing I'll add to that is um, I, I thought I heard that the, the General Assembly uh, leadership is generally opposed at this point to moving the primary. So an awful lot of moving parts on this. Um, question remains whether they are forced to do that or not. So yeah, I feel sorry for the local boards of elections that don't get moved. Yeah, they, they're under a lot of stress. I think they've moved forward based on the maps that have been proposed, and uh, you know they, the, have, the they courts, have to do something, right? The courts are law guard. Yeah, yeah and, and so many suits. It's as you say, absurd. Uh, so I thought I'd share with you. Basically, um, I thought that the Mako folks. Uh, did a good job yesterday kind of talking a little bit about the, the major bills uh, that are still in play. So I thought I'd kind of use that as a template and just run through those for you. Um, so a big ticket item is the, the Legionnaires Disease Prevention Act, the one where you would be required to sort of test and remediate uh, just about every building there is based on the fact that many of them were vacant or underutilized during the pandemic. So that bill stalled right now in the committees because the, the ticket is, the fiscal note is very, very large. Um, and I'll just say, generally speaking, from a fiscal perspective, um, the, the, the budget surplus is in most, for, for most of the budget surplus, it's one-time money. Uh, so they are gonna take a holistic look because as you imagine, when you're it's an election year combined with the fact that there is a surplus. Uh, a lot of bills have been put in to increase state funding. And so they'll be looking at those bills, um, at the large bills anyway, holistically, uh, to make sure that, that it's sustainable going forward. Um, one, one good news was uh, Senate Bill 40. Um, so now six systemic renovations are not considered um, eligible cost so they don't get state their state funding uh, contribution uh, this bill would say that 
if the costs are greater than 100,000, they would be considered eligible costs and eligible for the 11.5% contribution by the state. So that's in, in house appropriations right now. Uh, the Family Medical Leave Act, again, another uh, big ticket item. The uh, private sector is, is really pushing back hard on this apparently. And so there's uh, a lot of um, discussions going on there. The, the bill may be scaled back, uh, it may be uh, implemented in a, in a delayed fashion. So we're, we're keeping our eyes on that one. Uh, our our MAKO uh, bill to codify the 50-50 split in state and board of, e and board of elections uh, funding is out of the Senate committee. Uh, it's simplified. It, it just basically does codify that split. But it's now tied up with these larger election issues um, about how many polling places uh, a, a county must maintain, <coughs> uh, can they be reduced. Uh, so, so those things are, are still up in the air. And again, the whole issue about do we move the primary, what are the maps going to look like, so anything election related is, is sort of like in, in limbo right now. Um, another important bill that, that uh, for a number of years now, uh, I, the folks in your, in your land use area have concerns about ag land and, and ag assessment and, and, and uh, agritourism. So uh, Senate Bill 567 would say that uh, for accessory uses on ag property, they would be assessed at the ag property tax rate. So there's a lot of concern with locals about, you think about large, really non-ag related uses like large wedding venues. Uh, you think about, we've talked about this before, for example, the, the breweries where uh, you have, may have a farm brewery, but you may have a farm that has a brewery or a tasting room. Um, and is that real? Are they really using the products of the farm on that operation? So I think that um, you, you might remember, uh, commissioners, that, that uh, Jan Gardner from Frederick County was pretty vocal on this that they have a lot of folks that they believe are coming in to buy these ag properties with the express purpose of doing this and, and no intent on maintaining any agriculture on there. So that's another big hit to, uh, to the county purses. So um, that's, that's being pushed back on pretty strongly. Uh, we've talked about the body cam uh, bills. There are, there are three of them in play. Um, one is Senate Bill 31, which establishes a criteria for public information requests that will sort of tamp down on fishing expeditions. So it's very prescriptive in what you can refuse uh, to release. So it has to be really focused on an incident um, or, or uh, the protection of a witness, that sort of thing. So that passed on the Senate, out of the Senate committee. It was on the floor yesterday. I'm not sure how, uh, how that vote went, but, but I'll certainly follow up. Um, the, the other two, are there it's, well I should say there are two more one is an omnibus bill which includes the issue of having the state pay for the cost of the cameras the other is a bill in the house that is uh, is focused solely on sharing the cost or having this excuse me not sharing but having the state uh, pay for the, the entire package uh, Senator Sidner's bill Senate Bill 558 uh, that's the one that creates a, a, a central repository for all the camera data and then allows the counties to go in, access that data for redaction, review, and all the legal purposes. Uh, I think the one important point is that the General Assembly understands something has to be done about the costs. So I suspect you will see something come out of there that, it, that addresses that. Um, and as you've stated and, and your colleagues in the other counties have stated, it's the ongoing costs that are really the big part of the package here. Uh, House Bill 668 uh, related to the removal of health officers. Um, that's the one that, um, that defines the delegation role in it. 
uh, that was put forward by a, a Harford County delegate, and uh, that's probably not likely uh, to move at all. But the other bill, Senate Bill 548, is the one that, that uh, sort of defines the, the conditions under which a county can remove their health officer. Mm -hmm. So it's very prescriptive there. Uh, but something is likely to pass in that. I think you saw some media reports about the Hartford County <coughs> health officer that was uh, that was let go and had some strong words in the uh, in the bill hearing for that. Uh, House Bill 761 is the uh, the bill that Delegate Krebs put forward um, that would uh, require the county to as as the Board of Health to. Uh, establish conditions under which the health officer and his staff can issue uh, uh, stop orders, for example. Um, the hearing was pretty long, actually, and, and there was actually a lot of sympathy on the committee for the intent of the bill, which was to give, primarily to give people an avenue to appeal or to understand why that order was, was given. Um, right now, their only uh, recourse right now is, is through the courts. So there was a lot of sympathy, but there was also uh, a lawyer from this, the uh, University of Maryland School of Law that had some legal questions. She believed that it was not uh, in a shape that, that would actually do what the bill intended to do. Does this bill look fairly hopeful or do you have a feel for it? Is it? Is it? Like, what's the chances this move for you getting a feel for it so far? Um, there's a meeting Friday with uh, all of the, the stakeholders in the mm -hmm. bill to, to talk through it. Um, Mako is is going to be in that conversation. Have um, they held a position on this yet, or to be determined? Yeah, the, the Mako position was opposed, um, but I think that they want to be at the table because this may get somehow moved into the other bills about health officers. So this whole thing about dismissal and, and whether, uh, be, and, and it's complicated because of the role of the state and the role of the county in the health officer positions. So I, I have a feeling that something may come out of it, but it's, there are just too many legal questions right now that I heard posed in the, in the hearing. I appreciate that. The uh, gist of the the bill is to give the community an opportunity when questioned on you know their process procedure when something doesn't go right. Instead of going through a legal, very lengthy process to make it as low level as possible to determine whether it's appropriate or not. The challenge is, if it's us, do we have the ability, you know, sitting up here to justify its legality or its, you know, but we do have resources that we can reach out to, whether it be our legal support or, you know, precedents from other opportunities. I've said it once, I've said it a lot of times, I want to be governed at the lowest level possible. And although this is State Department agencies, if we can govern something at the lowest level and make decisions, then we should have that ability to do that. Um, there's still a lot of answers, you know, to questions, questions that haven't been asked, but um, I do support this, like I support a lot of other things, um, you know, in its, in its um, in intent. its meaning, the intent. Right? Yeah, in its mm -hmm. intent. I don't know if I support it in its form. Right. right. So yeah, I, I appreciate filling in the blanks because um, whatever we can do at the lowest level. So I mean, if if it's going to help, you know, us get there, you know, and there's a question about supporting it, you know, I I would like to have that conversation um, amongst us. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I'm for doing that, but I'm not going to blanket saying I support this, you know, uh, blindly because I don't know what that's going to put us in uh, as far as a bind. I think 
ultimately it may give the inspectors to be a little more accountable for what they do and mm -hmm. follow the regulations 100%. Yeah. Uh, you know, or whether it's a church group selling uh, baked goods at a table or the Boy Scouts getting shut down for selling lemonade, that's been a few years. But um, it gives them an appeal process somehow in here to come back and say, why did you do this to us? And, uh, and it makes the, I think, health inspector explain what circumstances were leading up to it, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. I, I do agree the intent is good. I'm not sure by the time the state gets done with it, it'll come out looking anything like it was intended to be. But yeah, I think yeah. It, it, your, your point is really, uh, really well taken. I think a lot of the anecdotes you hear are just that, that I don't know why I've been given this, where, where in the law does it say right. this? You know, one of, the, one of the supporting arguments has been, well, for example, when you get a traffic ticket, right. it tells you right on there what part of the Maryland code that you violated. Um, and there's nothing like that that occurs at this point. So again, I think that all the stakeholders are going to get together with the hope of ironing something out to meet the intent, and, and maybe it won't come in the form that the bill just, is currently. Just one question. How do you know what's on the traffic ticket? That you don't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Experience? Plead the um, fifth. So, That's what I heard. Would, would it help or do anything if we helped Delegate Krebs going into this conversation or no? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly have a discussion with her and, and, and okay. kind of, you know, explain what your discussion has been. I mean, is there any adverse issue <coughs> on this in, in moving forward? I don't know. Okay. Again, I, I don't, my, my challenge is I don't know what the process, I, I, I got the gist of it, you know, in reading it, but I, I'm just concerned that, I don't want to say we're liable, but we would be liable for a decision made. Do we have that skill set or do we have the reach for that skill set to make that decision? Uh, yeah, and, and, and maybe the first part of the bill that sort of prescribes that you, you have to develop uh, sort of the rules of the road for the health officer and their staff mm -hmm. and how they interact with the public, right? Um, maybe it's as simple as you have to quote the regulation. You know, I think that's what they're trying to get yeah. at, is give people something to help them understand why they've been called out on something. Um, and then, of course, the, the appeal process is still up right. in the air. I mean, the bill says you will be right. the judges on that as the Board of Health. But, again, the attorney from the School of Law said that you really don't have the authority to do that. So right. those are the questions that are all up in the air, and that's what Friday's discussion is yeah. supposed to work through. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I can certainly talk to our MAKO counterparts, too, and, and mm -hmm. see what their perspective is going in. Was this brought up at all yesterday? I can't see. No. <laughs> Was it? No. No. No, no and I, my, my stance on it, I would prefer to let MAKO take their lead on this. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, some of these decisions are well above my pay grade, and I'm, I'm not, I, I would rather see what comes out of the meeting on Friday. Yeah, yeah I, I, th I think at this point, if you, you know, all you have is the bill in front of you to weigh in on, and you're, right. Right. it doesn't sound like you're really. Yeah, well, I think the ship totally sailed, in support yeah, of the bill. The ship sailed on how the bill was written. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you don't yeah. really know what Friday's discussion is going to bring forth. I think maybe. Let's wait to see what yep. comes out of that. Okay. And then that point. Because to do yeah. anything else would sort of go against what MAKO has already said that they were doing, which is oppose the bill. So if we as a county can then say, well, wait a minute now, yeah. we kind of like the thing. I don't know that that's the best yeah. but, but I stance think, to yeah. take at this point. I'd rather see what the, okay. the results are of the Friday meeting. That, that's fine. I, th I think, well, I don't know. But for them to reconvene, to come back, is MAGO going to look at how they can support this bill? Or are they looking at to support part of the bill? I mean, do you have any feel on that? Well, I have to, if I can. 
Well, Mako opposes the bill usually because there's so much in the bill that they don't like. Right. When they usually their thing is support with amendments. Right. This means there's a core there that they really right. like, but there's these other things that they don't. But right. they, if we put these amendments in, it could really be good. So when they oppose, there's usually a lot in here that goes against what Mako would, would normally right. back. So I mean, I, I, just, I, I well, with Commissioner Wanser, let's wait to see what the discussion is and see what comes out of that before we make any any decision on our own. Because I do think there's some good a good curdle in this bill, but the other stuff is like I'm not even sure how if it, you know how if we have the authority to do it. And I, it's just too much up in the air, in my in my opinion. Yeah, in the hearing for the bill, um, the, the Mako policy analyst suggested that the ability to appeal already existed in the counties. But when he was challenged, he, he couldn't really articulate that. So I, I think the appeal is through the court system. Right, and the other thing to think about, too, is you, you guys know how our schedule is. You, know, you put in place an appeals process on the decisions that the health department is making, you're going to have to add another day because everybody's going to appeal it. I mean, I, that if, if, it, if it's going to make it easier to appeal these decisions, well, just like I said earlier this morning, everybody's going to want to do it. Everybody wants to get an attorney. But it could so, be as simple as the person who uh, creates the violation has to spell out where it is in the ordinance and explain it to the people if they <laughs> cite them. Well, that solves a lot of issues right there, but well, apparently that isn't happening at the present Well, time. I've made that happen quite a few times in seven years. And they don't have any basis to make times. Right, but when you, when you check them on it, we really get into it, then they're like, yeah, well, wait a minute, we could. So there, there kind of is a process if you want to do it. So I, don't, I just don't know of getting it to this level of where, you know, the local commissions or councils or however it works, sit as the Board of Health and then you hear appeals processes. I, I'm not sure that that's what we're looking to do here. I don't know. It may not solve the issue. Well, and to your point about MAKO, this is the mandate, right? So MAKO generally opposes like mandates mandate. and would prefer the flexibility at the local yeah. level, to your point. Right. So, yeah. All right, did we beat that horse yeah. sufficiently? <laughs> well, I look forward to getting the feedback if you can absolutely after Friday right yeah I'll, okay. I'll feed back Thank to you, you all and then if we need to yeah. reconvene okay. the discussion we can do yeah. this uh, so two environmental bills so the, the PFAS bill uh, good news on that the state will now purchase any stock that fire departments have of their firefighting foam that contains the chemical the PFAS chemicals so that, that's a good thing. That was a big concern with the fire departments uh, would be disposing of that. So MDE would be responsible for the purchase and the, the, uh, the destruction of the, of the material. And uh, I think you heard Mr. Robinson express some concerns about the, the bill that their turnout year that had this chemical was, was a problem. And that's been reduced now to if they sell that gear or if they uh, transfer it in some way, they simply have to submit a notice that it contains the chemical in it. So that was a, that was a win there. Uh, House Bill 633. So this is the issue that we, we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, the Accountability and Implementation Board membership. So currently, the, the current law simply says that um, the folks from the rural county, so Western Maryland, Eastern Shore, and Southern Maryland, have to be considered for nomination. Mm -hmm. This bill would say they have to be members of the board. So right now the board is seven members. It would increase to 11 to include those three regions of the state, and then a representative, I think, of the five most populous school systems in the state. Um, so Delegate Rose had asked for uh, support, mentioned to her that we, from a timing perspective, we could talk about that today, uh, but the hearing is today. So um, she asked if you could 
could write individually, and I think several of you did that. We made it clear that we would discuss the issue um, more formally and then come back with full board support. Right. So, uh, and, and I think we did. I know at least three of us wrote individually uh, on this to support, support her. Um, I don't know, Commissioner Boucher or Frazier, if you did or not. No, I, 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 to be honest with you, I don't like the idea that you're, you're telling somebody that, even I, I like the idea that they have to come from the different regions. I do like mm -hmm. that, but say if you come from the, you're automatically on the board. Don't like that idea. Um, so just just to make it clear, so that now you have to put forward a nominate. Well, you don't. You have to consider them in the nomination. So you, you have to consider right. people from those three regions in the nomination. But now. It would have to be someone from Western Maryland, so that's Allegheny, Garrett, Frederick, and Carroll. And then the Eastern Shore counties are a block, and then Southern Maryland is a block. So there will be someone serving on the board from those geographic regions, along with others that, mm -hmm. that make up the board. So that's what that is. So someone from those right. regions. I, 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 I got okay. you. You, you don't like it? I like the idea to have to be considered for the board. I think we should be considering from all different geographical reasons because I think mm -hmm. they're not represented right now. But to say someone from this region has to sit on the board, I, I thought that's the part I don't like. If, if I may, Mr. Burke, doesn't you, the high judiciary in this state exercise something similar to that with appointees? On the Court of Appeals and the uh, Court of Special Appeals, don't they have regional representation? Yes, that's correct. So there is an existing template for this concept in our judiciary. Well, you can write a letter of support it then. <laughs> well, I'm I'm not sure what that was, but well, I'm, what I'm saying is this is not out of the norm for a concept. If it's applied in the judiciary, then it would meet the legal sniff test, so to speak, if this got implemented. I guess I'm not worried about legal sniff test. I'm I'm worried about representation of Carroll County. The potential on, for Carroll County. That's right. Rep yeah. Yes, on this commission. Yeah. I mean that's what it's about. Yeah. The bottom is, line is before it was the metro region right. only. Right. And, I, and, and I left want, out yeah. all the sides. Right. Now we want to bring the sides in. Yeah. But well, what I'm getting at is I'm reinforcing that this is a positive and it would meet the judiciary requirement. I'm not against it. What I'm saying, I'm reinforcing this position. Yeah, but it has nothing to do with judiciary. It has to do with representation for the schools. I mean, for us oh, to be. I understand. I think you're missing my point. Well, there was, I, I am. The bill. I think there's the bill that says that they have to be considered. That wasn't even out there before, correct? It was. Yes, they had. So yes, they had to be considered, but if, so in the nominations, they would be considered, but if no one were not, were submitted, that was the problem I think that occurred this time, was no one from those regions submitted to be part of the board. Okay. Well, okay. that's the excuse right. that the senators are using for the way that they chose the current board. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know all the ins and outs. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, but if no one was submitted. <laughs> I, I understand that point. I think, though, this will cause the region, which is the four counties, because Frederick's out of it, for right? For our region, right. For our region to select somebody to be represented on this board. And it'll expand it from 7 to 11. Right, correct. Right. Which I think is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, I don't think it's a Represent bad idea. Yeah, representation is a good thing. Yes. So, um, as opposed to getting overwhelmed by, like Steve said, the, the metro, you know, populations. So, like I said, I think individually we did letters, but if we can look at doing a letter from the Board of Commissioners in support of this adds value, right? And that's, right. I think, what's being asked. So, you know, if do we need a motion or we just need an agreement on this? I mean, does it matter? I say, re you know, write a letter for the Board of Commissioners and have all signatures. Well, it's due yesterday, right? Today. 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 Yeah, you can still get the letters in. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I'm in support. Yeah. So there's one. All right. Good. Move two. Good. Three, four, okay. Five. That's fine. <laughs> Keep going. So I'll, I'll basically submit the same language, it's just yes, tweak the little bit. Yep. Thank you. Definitely understand your point, though. Okay. Highway user revenues. Uh, so, Commissioner Wentz, you're going to testify on the yeah. 9th and the 10th. Well, yeah. The the House ninth, and Senate. Well, the 9th is in no. person, so it's going to be interesting to, to be uh, in the, the hollowed chambers again. Yes. Yes. You'll have and a lot of your colleagues virtual, so with I, you. Yeah, I can do that from here. But tonight, I'm going to have to road trip. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and obviously, it's very critical. I, I passed a chart. I think I forwarded a chart to you that, that Mako put together <clears throat> that showed where you were in fiscal year 2007 and where you were in the latest fiscal year. Yeah, you want to know what that figure is? And the cumulative loss <laughs> over the years, uh, a little over $150 million to their calculations. So there it is. Yep. It's a lot of money. Yeah. 2007, <clears throat> we were receiving 14.4 mil, and 23, 5 million for a difference of 9.4. So and cumulative, yeah. it's 150. Point almost 151. Almost 151. And that five million is up from what it was before. That's I think we're too as low as, yeah, as low as two million at one point. Yeah, because that, right. that that was part of the deal last year where it sunsets or whatever. A few, and few seasons, a uh, few sessions right. ago. Yes, and the sunset was after after 24. So my testimony is going to focus on Carol and specifics, and I think that's what Mako is looking for. Uh, not to throw a lot of rhetoric at them, but be specific. And give them how it's affected Carol. So I'm going to hit that heavy. Mike and I are going to work um, together on that, and we need to get uh, casting away to throw a couple things into the mix. He already has, but yes, right. yeah. I mean, there, so. there, there are a lot of members of the General Assembly that were here in 2007, but most were not, and really don't have a grasp on the impact that that has had over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Director yes. Castingway has had a lot of heartburn. <laughs> So this would be a big benefit to him if we can get some more capital in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I would assume then that everyone is on board also with that one. Yeah. Yeah. You might want to ride along. Let me know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll write collectively. It's always fun to have somebody well. to ride along with. So if anybody wants to go, let me know. Commissioner Weaver may <laughs> attend with you. Um, yep. Yeah, so talk about sprinklers. <laughs> um, the one thing I did want to mention quickly uh, before I forget is the, the cannabis issue. So the House did pass their referendum question bill, right. uh, which basically says, "Are you in favor of recreational use for adults, 21 or over?" Um, so that's going to go over to the Senate now. Um, Senate ha and, and they also passed a bill that would de decriminalize it, um, would provide for expungements of convictions, simple convictions, um, and would also uh, define levels of possession that were legal and illegal and so forth. So mm -hmm. that was passed along with it, but nothing so far to the tax structure. That's all in the Senate bills. So there's obviously a big difference of opinion between the Senate and the House, which is not unusual, uh, particularly with these two new leaders. Um, so we'll have to see now what mm -hmm. the Senate does with that issue. Um, and also cybersecurity, I would be remiss if I mentioned uh, Mark Ripper participated in a, in a press conference, a video conference yesterday on a package of cybersecurity bills <coughs> uh, that, that are really good. I think he, he had mentioned uh, at least mentioned to me that over the summer, he and his colleagues have participated in developing uh, these bills and that they didn't quite come out the way everyone had agreed, but there's agreement now uh, that they've been amended. And, uh, and, and so it's really about more coordination between the state and the local governments and, uh, and also additional funding uh, for the issues. So it sounds like everybody's coming together on that. I think Harry was hacked. 
I'm sorry. If I nothing, I said I heard the hearing was hacked. It, yeah. If uh, I can add a, a little bit of anecdotal on that is um, the importance of the government, local and state and federal, along with academia and business communities coming together for best practices is crucial. And last week I attended a very good panel discussion on cybersecurity with either four, I think it was four on the panel um, from the private sector. And three, and one of them came from the agency, maybe two, and then into the private sector. When asked the question, what keeps them up at night, you know, besides the indigestion, all that kind of stuff, it was local community. It was local government cybersecurity. And I was like, wow. I mean, th these guys are national figureheads. And, um, you know, they have very strong business, you know, um, community ties uh, and into the federal government. And that's what they said was local um, county cybersecurity practices. So I did reach out to Mark to share that with him. Um, you know, obviously the weakest link is the individual, you know, in practice, but to uh, continue to focus our attention and obviously, you know, one of the catalysts is what's going on overseas right now. But um, I just felt that was worth sharing because that was a pretty, it, it woke me up <laughs> from the panel. I was like, really? I was not expecting to hear that. And uh, I think three out of the four said the exact same thing. So. Yeah, I think people yeah. are in a good place now. The previous session, at, at the very least, it seemed to be a top-down approach. Right. The state wanted to be in control and mandate. Right all the way down to what kind of training programs local governments could use. But this now seems to be a much more collaborative effort um, and an understanding that there are individual roles to play. So I think people are, I think it was described as not everything they want, but right. very good. good, good. And um, there's an article in the Washington Post today with regard to that. I, yeah, <laughs> an article in the Washington Post today with regard to that um, uh, press conference or, or um, yeah. yesterday, and our Mr. Ripper is um, quoted in it. So I forwarded the link okay. to you. He's in, in the Sun's article as well. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Good deal. Excellent. I think that's all I have for you today. For uh, discussion, um, we talked uh, a lot about 761 already, and we're going to wait for Friday. Right. Um, outcome the uh, compensation benefits right. um, not much more of discussion it's uh, through the Senate or the subcommittee um, it's in the Senate committee and House right. hearings not scheduled yeah. we received a letter from the senator you know Reedy um, you know and we've had conversations uh, I am very confident that all of these bills have been discussed by all of us in open session, whether they've been discussed uh, to the depth or length that some would want, that's regardless. Um, they've been all brought up to our attention and, uh, and highlighted um, on our um, intent in moving forward with these. Uh, I got the gist personally from that letter. Uh, the parochial piece I kind of put to the side, but that's okay. But I did get the gist, and the gist is, hey, let's continue, like Commissioner Weaver says, strong communications, you know, whether we like it or not. Um, don't know where this is going to end up, you know, as a result. That's regardless, it's going to be in their hands. But we're just going to continue to let them know how we feel about it, and that's it. And that's what we did. Um, so. There is no House committee scheduled right now. Correct. I believe. Um, don't know if we're going to have any. If we're not going to have impact on the Senate hearing, we're not going to have impact on the House. So, you know, it's that's kind of where we're at with that specific bill. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because I've had the conversations with them, you know, most of them. So, them being the legislation. Okay. Anything else? Mike, really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, okay. Mr. Thank you. Okay.
Now we're going to get into the Siegel discussion. Let's see where this is going to take us. Um, Ted, are you going to come up and we're going to talk about the Siegel discussion and then we're going to uh, have the Siegel representatives uh, talk um, virtually. We have the presentation in front of us and I'm sure it'll also be shared on the screens. But Ted? Before I dive into this, just touch on two things that Mike said. You know, uh, he made a comment about the state surplus being largely one, one time. I just want to say, you know, just kind of by definition, it's all one time. And I think it's an important point to make because there's a lot of people who want to do things that are ongoing, both in terms of new spending or reducing revenue, and it just doesn't work. And then the other thing was he mentioned um, that the state might pay for cameras for uh, the body cameras. Mm -hmm. That would be a good thing if that happened. But uh, just a reminder that our big costs here are about people, not about right. the cameras. Right. Okay, so the Siegel report. Um, in just a few minutes, you're going to be hearing from Siegel, getting their assessment of Carol's organization and workforce. I want to remind you that when we took this, this effort on, we knew that we were doing it on a tight timeline. Choices had to be made on how to spend the available time and resources. And as you listen to the report, it's possible at some point one of you is going to say, why didn't we look at fill in the blank? And the answer to that question will almost certainly be because there wasn't enough time to look at everything we wanted to and we had to make choices as we made our way along. I also want you to understand, we didn't simply hand this off to, to Siegel. Uh, we've been very involved in, in this effort, uh, providing information, context, clarification, supplemental work to the things that they are doing, and that continues now. Now, it's still months away, but there is a second part of this, a second report that will be coming to you on the compensation and position classifications. Now, these are separate reports, but they're not independent of each other. You know, each report has its own focus, but how we compensate our employees and how we provide services are inherently bound together. When the time comes for action for decisions, we will need to consider all of this. And I want to come at that a little different way, too. You know, eventually, there will be recommendations to uh, improve compensation. But I want to be clear, the goal of this was not to increase compensation. The goal is to assure we can attract and retain the employees we need to provide services. The goal here is really to protect our ability to provide services. Now, the reason we're talking about this at all is because the commissioners recognized the concerns. You know, we've talked a lot about the declining number of applicants, the declining number of qualified applicants, the growing number of posted until filled positions, job offers being declined, our aging workforce, and other growing difficulties. Now, we're being pulled along with big national trends, but our difficulties are, are more than that. We are losing competitive ground to others. So you asked for a deeper look at these concerns and for potential solutions. Now, we didn't hire Siegel to identify our problems for us. We pretty we were pretty sure we knew what our problems were. What Siegel is doing for us is helping to better define those problems, help us understand the underlying issues, and to help us identify potential paths to solutions or improvement. Now, Siegel will not be offering answers. You know, it can be tempting to, to say, okay, just tell us what we should do. Uh, but they can't offer us answers because there are no answers. There are no easy answers, at least. Uh, what they will offer is their assessment of our opportunities to change and improve. And they will offer recommendations on how to best focus our time and energy and funding as we make our choices. Now, they're going to talk about transformational change, cultural change. This is important, and I really encourage you to pay particular attention to this part of what they're going to talk about. There are lots of small changes that, that we can make, but that's not where our focus should be. Uh, they're going to be looking at cultural change that can open paths for improvement. 
Again, I want to be clear, and we're going to be talking about some hard things, but this is not about us having failed. We didn't suddenly arrive where we are today. Where we are, who we are today, is the product of decades worth of organizational change and decisions that have been made and reacting to changing environment and circumstances. This is about us preparing to tackle our future and putting ourselves in a position to continue to succeed. Now, I said cultural change, and that can be in lots of things. I just want to hit on a couple ideas. One, and I think this is really important, historically, boards of commissioners have been largely content knowing that our pay was lagging behind our competitors. Uh, there are lots of reasons offered for that, but under it, it was basically, we're okay with that. Um, I think my argument, and I think what you'll hear from Siegel, is we can't afford for that to be okay anymore. Those things I talked about now are, in part at least, the, the product of the way we've looked at this for years. We either need to change our approach to how we attract and retain employees, or we're going to have to acknowledge that our ability to provide services will have to change. This isn't just about what is the pay scale, though. We're also going to need to reconsider our pay practices and where they might not align with our needs. When I talk about pay practices, I'm talking about things like how do we decide how much we offer somebody who's coming here with experience? How do we reward somebody who's taking a promotion within Carroll County? There are lots of pieces like that, and how we approach those historically is also a piece of this, this picture we're looking at. Now, providing services just keeps becoming more and more complex every time. And you know, some of the legislative things you're talking about, every legislative session makes our lives more difficult in trying to figure out how do we do the things that we do. And the dangers of having knowledge and skills held by one person or just a small number of people is growing. You know, 30 years ago, you know, maybe it was, it was okay, but I think now we, we have to be very concerned about this. And the need for collaboration is growing as well. We can't afford organization silos. And again, 30 years ago, maybe it was okay. You know, this group of people was doing this, and this group of people was doing this. The way things work now, we just can't afford to have people operating separately. We, we need to promote a much more universal idea of how does this work for the county, not just how does it work for this piece of the job. Now, in the report, human resources and IT get a lot of attention. Uh, I think this is going to be an important part of the discussion. But I just want to say neither of those pieces of the organization exist in a vacuum. They're part of the same culture and the same history and the same evolution as we're, we're talking about here. And the concerns and opportunities in those areas are just a piece of these larger opportunities and concerns. I'm encouraging you to listen for the big ideas, listen for the opportunities for us to change our path. Now, in saying that, I'm not suggesting that we ignore any questions you might have along the way, <coughs> things that you do want to talk about. We, we need to address whatever is on your mind that will get you comfortable with how we continue on from here. I, I just want to say, you know, try not to make it about the little stuff, try and keep on the big stuff. Uh, Siegel is going to follow me now to talk about their work and findings. Next week, some of us will be back to you to talk about what came out of that discussion and to begin talking about where do we go from here. Now remember, Siegel's work will not be done until the end of June. So we're bringing you a piece of it now, but there's still more to come. And again, we're months away from wrapping that all up. Now, there might be some pieces of implementation that we can start acting on in the, in the short term. Uh, a lot of this will have to wait until we're actually into fiscal year 23. And one of the things we have to do in the budget process is coming is identify a pot of money that's going to be in the FY23 budget, even though we don't know yet what the decisions are to, to use it. But if, if we don't do that, we're going to get to FY23, we're going to get to the point of saying, okay, what are we going to do? 
but we won't have any resources available to actually act on those ideas. Uh, I expect as we go through the budget process, um, this is going to be a frequent topic of conversation. It's going to be tied to many other things that we're thinking about. Now, okay, I see on our monitor that we do have our Siegel representatives. Um, you can see you can see their names too, so I'm not going to introduce them formally. But we've spent enough time with them that you know I would just think of them as Rebecca, Jennifer, and 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 Scott. Uh, we probably know more about each other in some ways than we would have expected when we we, we started all this. Ted, if I can, I'll go ahead. I apologize. Keep going. I was just going to say, including that uh, at least some of them live in Buffalo, and we got to see some <laughs> snow through windows. Yes. And fireplaces. Yes. So, very nice fireplace. Um, but uh, I'd just like to share, and again, this is the second time I'm, which kind of bothers me that I'm quoting Commissioner Wance, but, you know, when it, when it fits, it fits, and transparency is huge. We're doing this openly, you know, to our viewers and to our community. Um, it ain't about the emperor doesn't have a clothes. It's about the emperor and look at the clothes that we do have and how things need to be adjusted to be effective and efficient moving forward. This ain't done behind closed doors just like our budget, you know, isn't done. This is huge. And this is a huge step to me reaching out to the community. So what I'm asking is that the community and others, especially on this social media garbage, don't jump to conclusions as this is not conclusive. This is navigating us to the next steps. And uh, that's my biggest concern. When people look at slide decks like this, they say, oh, something's broker, this is minimized. This is not conclusive and we got a lot of work to do. Uh, so I really appreciate the team that's about to talk to us. And I really appreciate our approach and being transparent that twice now. To the community, okay, um, and uh, that, that's huge. So um, yeah, I so think that's an that. important point. We're we're taking a hard look at ourselves here, and and some of it's uncomfortable. You know, it's it, it'd be easy to say, well, why don't we just look away from that? But but I, I think it's important that we do take this look, and we very consciously take <clears throat> it in our hands to say, how do we feel about this? And if we don't like it, what do we want to do about it? I'll say I think this will probably be the most important legacy item that this board does before we leave. And I sincerely appreciate your presentation. I think that was one of the best presentations, the most important long-term presentations you've ever given us. Thanks for setting this up. Okay, what's the next step, Ted? For our single representatives to okay. talk to you. So appreciate uh, good morning to all. Um, and uh, it's 50 degrees out here. I don't know what it's in Buffalo, but it's regardless because we're all indoors. So whoever wants to uh, kick it off, please. And thank you. Good morning. I'll, I'll kick us off. I'm one of the folks in Buffalo. It's uh, 20 degrees, and uh, I think it's dropping down to 10 at some point this evening. So uh, we're, we're yearning for, uh, for, for spring, uh, hopefully around the corner somewhere soon. Um, Good morning, commissioners, and, and, and thank you for allowing us to, to appear before you. We're honored to be here today, and um, thank you, Ted, for, uh, for the preamble and the good comments. Um, I think your, your comments uh, frame the, the, both the project and the work and the outcomes uh, really, really well. And, and so one of the things that, uh, let me just by way, by way of introduction, let me introduce the team. Um, I'm Scott Nastaya. Uh, I'm the national practice leader at Siegel of what we refer to as an organizational effectiveness practice. Uh, we're the organization uh, within Siegel that works with uh, county governments, with public and private entities on a whole host of organizational and operational issues, exactly what he engaged us uh, to do here. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Jennifer Donnelly, also a senior vice president uh, within our firm. Uh, she is a, a noted and national expert <clears throat> in issues relative to change management and organizational uh, efficiency. Um, and then Rebecca Robb is an expert within our firm on data analytics, 
um, and, uh, and a whole host of other uh, activities where she was a vital role and member of, uh, of the team here. We had a couple other members that participated in the um, in the uh, in the work uh, that aren't joining us today, but uh, uh, we'll make mention of them along the way. Um, so we're going to uh, walk you through a presentation. I'll just make a couple comments before we start. Um, I think Ted, your your comment is is, is spot on. Um, when we started the work. Um, we, we knew that we were entering into an era of um, incredible change, uh, not only for the county government, and, and Commissioner Boucher, your comment is, is right. This, I, I suspect this will be one of the most important legacy things up in front of you. Uh, it needs to be, um, as you'll hear the story as, as we uh, as we as we weave, weave it through. I think that uh, we found that um, when we entered into our discussions and looking at data and, and talking to folks uh, across the, the many that we spoke to in, in the county government uh, itself, um, we found a very uh, common and similar story that resonated throughout. And that is that um, there are systemic challenges that are in play here that um, there's no single issue, there's no uh, easy fix, there's no there's not a single thing that can be done to address the issues, including uh, compensation. Um, if compensation were just the issue, uh, you could be done with it and uh, resolve your issues. There are many, many other issues that are attended to uh, really making sure that you have in place a competent team, uh, that you're able to provide services to uh, your community, to your constituents um, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that they become used to um, and even better and improved um, in the years to come. So let us walk you through kind of a story what we would like to tell you. Um, it, it starts with a, um, a, a story that is all too familiar to um, many entities, not just Carroll County, that really begins with um, a, uh, a kind of a perfect storm, if you will, of <clears throat> uh, challenges that uh, organizations like uh, Carroll County and others are, are facing. So Becca, let us go through the, the beginning um, part of our deck here. So, I won't go through the executive summary, you'll have a chance to read that, but just a couple highlights in the executive summary worth noting. Um, so some of the perfect storm started uh, maybe decades ago, but I think was underscored by what happened in 2008, 2009. Um, the, the, the fiscal realities, the Great Recession, as it was called by some, uh, resulted in about 100 positions um, that were uh, that were reduced or were lost uh, within the county government um, that have not been replaced. Uh, and so you've been operating uh, the last decade um, in, an, in an environment with um, where you're largely understaffed. One of the common refrains we heard from people um, as we started our interviews was that you'll hear us talk about, uh, this is what people would say to us, we're a county of one. Uh, we have one person that does this. We have one person that does that. We have one person that does this. And we, and we saw evidence of that. And the point that they were making was that um, reductions in positions over the course of time have, have resulted in the burdens and responsibilities of uh, core operational functions uh, really residing and resting on a single individual, um, which of course creates a whole host of challenges for the county moving forward, including succession risks, uh, the liability and risk and vulnerability that you face uh, when those people leave, they hold knowledge that is really unique to their, their part of the county government. Um, and you have, you'll, as you'll see in our story, um, kind of a uh, underserved uh, succession planning effort or, or, or knowledge transfer. Uh, so you have a, a, a large degree of vulnerabilities. And then as I'll point out in greater detail in the, in the next few slides, um, the pandemic and all the elements that that brought to uh, organizations like yours um, uh, contributed to, the, to this perfect storm. And so we just make a comment that um, you know, the, 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 Ted used the word transformational change. That's what will be required here. Um, and again, not just looking at compensation. There are technology issues, there's process issues, there's structural issues, there's organizational issues, there's cultural issues, all of which have an a important part of the story. So go ahead, Becca. Let me start with just a little bit of background and context. It's important to understand um, the market and, and the forces that will be at play. They're at play today. Um, and they'll continue to be at play uh, across your county government um, over the next decade. Um, these challenges and, and the issues that are uh, beginning to appear or that are, other, or that are in full force uh, are not going away anytime soon. And as you'll see as we go through the story, uh, you'll understand why. 
The first is um, you have a, a, a changing demographic in the, in the workforce. You know, you have um, uh, an incredible uh, increase across the country, not just in Carroll County, but across the country and in retirements of the baby boomers. Uh, 10,000 Americans turn 65 every single day. Uh, and that rate will continue from today until the year 2030. And so, yeah, as you'll see in a minute, Carroll County, within the next few years, 45% of your workforce uh, will be at or above retirement age um, uh, within just a few years. Um, and so what's happened is that um, the millennial generation was largely seen as the generation that will replace the, the baby boomers as they retire. Uh, we saw an acceleration of retirements in, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, two million Americans uh, retired in 2019, uh, an additional million, three million Americans retired in 2020, an additional more than three million retired in 2021. Um, so just in that period alone, uh, eight million Americans no longer available uh, to the U.S. workforce. What we see in the comments about the millennials is that today the millennials represent about a little more than a third of the U.S. working population. By 2025, they'll represent, uh, along with Gen Z, they'll represent 75% of, of the workforce. And so that, that'll apply to Carroll County too. Um, so by 2025, 2026, uh, the majority of the employees working in the county will be of a millennial and, and Gen Z generation. And so why is that important? It's important to understand that your workforce is changing and the uh, things that attract, the motivations that attract and um, both people to join organizations and to stay at organizations uh, are largely different among the millennial and Gen Z generation than we found in the baby boomer and Gen X generation, which is uh, essentially what your workforce is today. Um, we also are experiencing low unemployment um, or in, in the labor shortage. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the labor shortage. You know, pre-pandemic, we were uh, the lowest unemployment in the U.S. in you know, the last 50 years. We're seeing some return to that, but compounded with um, the labor shortage. So let's go to the next slide, Becca. So what, what's, what's causing some of this labor shortage? So I've talked about the accelerated retirements. Uh, we also know that in great number in 2020 and 2021, women um, have left the workforce um, in great numbers. Uh, about two million, uh, uh, two and a half million women left the workforce in 2020. Some came back in 2021. Uh, but an estimated 1.8 million women will not return to the workforce, um, largely stemming from desires to return back to the home, uh, return back to uh, more uh, work-life balance, or opting for non-traditional uh, career kinds of jobs. So looking for internet-based jobs or other uh, sources of income. Um, we also know that um, this will impact the um, interest and motivations of millennials. And I always share this data point because it's staggering. Um, and many of you or some of you may be experiencing this or seeing this in your own worlds and your own lives, but um, there's an there's a incredible transfer of wealth that'll be occurring in this country over the next uh, seven or eight years. Between now and the end of the decade, uh, by the end of the year 2030, an estimated $68 trillion will transfer hands from the baby boomer generation to the millennial generation. It'll make the millennials the richest generation in American history. Prior to the pandemic, we knew that millennials, oddly enough, uh, would be the first generation in American history that would make less than their parents, and they probably still will. Uh, it, but because of the wealth transfer, they'll be the richest generation in American history. Again, why is that important? It's important to know because the motivations that will drive millennial workforce to county government are different than what prior generations were, were driven to. Um, and then um, why I say this is a really a decades long problem is you had a declining birth rate in the 1980s and 1990s and probably even continuing into the 2000s across the country. And so we know uh, we do a lot of work with higher education. Every college and university in the country is preparing for a significant decline in college students uh, by the year 2026, knowing that the number of 18 year olds that are gonna be in the country about significant drop. And so the available workforce uh, post-2026 um, will not meet the same numbers um, that are even in the, in the workforce today. So go ahead, Becky. On top of that, um, you've read about it, seen about it, and experienced here in Carroll County, um, the, the great resignation or the big quit. 
Um, we know that three and a half million uh, Americans quit their jobs uh, every month uh, in the month of in the year of 2021, compounded by November and December, where four and a half million Americans uh, quit their jobs. We don't know what the January numbers are, but I suspect they'll be they'll be something similar. And so we've been looking at it. Uh, other organizations have been studying it. Um, and so why are people leaving? Um, work culture. Um, you know, um, uh, Fortune magazine did a uh, study of 300,000 millennials uh, and asked them, why are you leaving? Why are you quitting your jobs? And, and the top three reasons, number one was a toxic work culture. Um, if they thought that they, you know, felt that they worked in a, in a uh, uninspiring uh, workforce, if they had a bad boss, if they had a bully uh, that they worked for, um, they're, they're leaving in, in, in large numbers. That was number one. Um, number two was uh, the lack of uh, flexibility in, in uh, where they work. So remote work options. Um, and then third was pay, um, pay equity. Um, and so you see some of that uh, uh, in, in the report we'll get here in a moment. Um, so again, all of these things um, are uh, impacting will continue to impact your ability to both retain and recruit a, a workforce in the future. Go ahead, Becca. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, just repeating it, um, you know, th this isn't a, a, a post-pandemic one year. We're going to get out of this, and you know, we're going to be back. Um, this is a this is. We think that the numbers and the underlying issues that are driving this are issues that are going to uh, permeate um, the workforce and the landscape for the next decade. Go ahead, Becca. So in our report here, um, in our work at Carroll County, uh, we focused on. Uh, four primary activities. Uh, one, uh, we requested from Roberta and, and uh, Ted and the team uh, a whole host of documents, hundreds of documents. Uh, they were gracious and provided us uh, in your comment about open transparency, uh, gave us access to anything and everything we asked for. Um, we reviewed those, we looked at policies, we looked at org charts, we looked at job descriptions, we looked at a whole host of data. Um, so that was one activity to help inform our, our findings. Um, the second was we got out and talked to as many people as uh, made sense. Uh, we, we did 123 interviews, uh, including each of you. Um, we did um, other uh, uh, employees across the, uh, uh, across the organization, directors, managers, employees themselves. Um, and then another 53 people um, added, uh, added comments. So all in all, we had uh, perspectives from uh, 176 uh, individuals at that point. Um, you get a pretty good sense of how people are feeling about things, um, where the where the issues are. We also created a staffing model, uh, which we're not going to show in detail today. I'm happy to share it in detail, um, but uh, we'll send that along. Make sure you have that. But it projects uh, future staffing opportunities and options uh, in front of the county. Excuse me. Um, and then we used our uh, all of the information and, uh, and data that was gathered as a result of. The, uh, the findings, the documentation review, even the staffing model uh, to develop our report. Um, and then just leading practices, uh, things that we're aware of uh, in the market. And that's what you really have in front of you today. Go ahead, Becca. Okay, so let me go through the findings. Um, we found four thematic areas that really sort of continued again uh, this perfect storm and, and challenges that are in front of you. Um, the, the first is, um, what we would put under the category of sort of a number of strategic challenges. And here, what we're, what we're uh, pointing out, we'll point out in more detail, is that the county really doesn't have a clear um, strategy um, and vision for how it's going to address these issues, uh, but how it's going to align investments and expenditures and um, address uh, and prioritize uh, the issues that it, that it has in front of it. Um, so there's not a commonly shared vision or strategic plan to guide priorities and investments. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Second, a whole host of workforce challenges that are uh, impacting your ability to recruit and retain people. Um, so the challenge is going to only get worse. Um, and then uh, pointing out that um, real risks, I pointed out that county of one, uh, but other areas where you just have a significant risk and vulnerability around succession and staffing. Um, third area was just in the structure and staffing itself. So there are a number of opportunities to realign structures and gain some efficiencies, but many of those or most of those are uh, will be uh, informed or aided by uh, 
uh, improvements in technology. Um, you know, very low use of technology across the county today, and you're behind the times. And so opportunities exist to create efficiencies through automation, through streamlining processes, um, which will allow you to sort of uh, stabilize your workforce, um, be less reliant on uh, people who process paper, um, and, and uh, actually turn jobs into more uh, service-oriented, uh, customer service-oriented jobs. And then this last point um, uh, in a thematic area is really just the infrastructure and technology that the technology itself is preventing um, you from advancing uh, the organization in an effective and efficient way uh, moving forward. So let me dive into each of these uh, in, uh, in, in a little more detail. Go ahead, Becca. So um, first of all, just a, just a few strengths um, that we uh, want to uh, highlight. So these are good comments that people said and observations that we made about the workforce itself. Uh, clearly, you have a, a, a dedicated and committed and hardworking uh, workforce. Um, I'm also a person, uh, a, a real deep sense of commitment to the county uh, and the com community they serve. This is an incredible strength that you have, and it's probably, uh, by and large, the reason that you've had a fairly good retention. Um, you won't always enjoy that, particularly as your workforce changes. Um, and you have a, a millennial and Gen Z workforce, not that they won't be hardworking and committed, um, but you know what you have in place today is a long-term workforce um, that has uh, their heart and soul uh, of the community and the county apart. Um, so that's going to be a challenge, uh, replacing that um, over the course of time. High levels of pride in what people do uh, in their role and their contribution. Uh, people think they are making and believe they're making a difference. Um, and they have a lot of talent. Um, there's a lot of talented people on the team, um, good people, uh, hardworking, as I mentioned, uh, but also um, good, knowledgeable, smart people understand where the gaps are in service, um, but also where the limitations and improvement things are. Um, you have a very generous benefit package. Um, that could be leveraged more and probably to a better extent to uh, both attract people, and you'll need to do that uh, moving forward. Uh, your tuition benefits uh, program uh, was seen as good and supportive of professional growth. Um, and then people want to talk about um, in, and recognize just the ample pay type off um, and, and, the, and the value that that's uh, created and generated by that. Go ahead, Becca. All right, so let me talk about uh, some of these strategic issues. So as I, as I mentioned in the overview, um, you know, the, the, there's a lack of a shared vision and, um, and really strategic thinking in, in, in many of the uh, activities. Uh, and again, for good reason. Part of, part of the contributing uh, challenge may be even the way you're structured as a government, um, quite frankly. Um, you have um, a fair amount of uh, turnover and um, uh, among commissioners. And so we're told that, as we would imagine, that you know commissioners are passionate and committed and um, but they don't always see eye to eye on things and uh, they have different perspectives and different views over the years and so gaining consensus among the commissioners um, on uh, specific priorities and strategies uh, changes um, as commissioners change so those interests and priorities so the result has been when you look for a common theme of thread of where are we headed as a county and do we have a good strategic plan and vision for the future um, it gets a little murky um, and so certainly some priorities, year-to-year -year priorities, um, but long-term vision and, and priorities that you would see in other kinds of organization uh, probably uh, isn't the same. We also know that, um, you know, you've been sort of, uh, sort of challenged over the years, recognizing, as Ted said, um, there's, no, there's no mystery on where, where some of the challenges are, um, but they, need, they have needed investment, and in some cases, substantial investment. Um, either in terms of staffing levels or uh, pay or technology, uh, which always has a hefty price tag. Um, but I think the recognition has been that to do that, um, there needs to be more, re more revenues into the, into the county government. And that, you know, uh, the appetite for uh, increasing tax revenues or fees um, has not been strong. Uh, and so, um, you know, counties have to, have to balance um, the need to uh, maintain a low tax, a low fee environment um, with a low revenue environment to um, unaddress uh, some of these some of these uh, challenges that do require some investment. 
So we've seen that and we can see some of the manifestation about that. We know that you've got this new integration of fire and EMS. Not clear what the long-term financial impact of that. We didn't study it to the final letter in a detailed spreadsheet, but probably more to be done there in really understanding how that will impact your finances. We did make note that when we looked at a number of strategic things that are facing the county, we looked at the role of the county administrator and said, where is her role in driving and guiding these activities or these conversations or leading these more strategic initiatives or opportunities that are presented? And what we found is that by a large amount, the county administrator is focused on day-to-day operations. And for good reason, there's not staff. And so we're in other governments and other entities and other organizations, you would see a deputy, a deputy director, or a chief lieutenant to help manage day-to-day operations, which would allow the county administrator to act and address more strategic issues. You don't have that luxury here. And so the county administrator is being straddled with day-to-day activities, which probably limits, again, the ability to address and resolve or move strategic issues forward. And so we just make this point down the bottom of the page, the inability to address these strategic and foundational issues will have, you know, will limit the ability to make transformational change. So you'll see in our recommendations that all of this story has to kind of come together to address these rather mounting and strategic issues. Go ahead, Becca. The second issue we want to raise is really, as I mentioned earlier in my overview comments about the aging workforce. I'll show a chart here in a second, but, you know, nearly half of the workforce will be ready or over their retirement, your average retirement age in less than five years. And so when you say, you know, what are you doing to prepare for that? You know, what kind of succession plans do you have in place? There's a form and there's a general, you know, sort of check the box kind of process in place, but nothing really meaningful that is preparing people to take key jobs within the county. And so you don't see training, you don't see mentoring, you don't see an organized and structured effort to begin to transfer knowledge and to build successors so that people know how to get critical roles done. And in an environment where you have low use of technology, the lack of succession planning means that the people that are doing the jobs, if you're relying on their knowledge, what's the knowledge that's in their head? It's not in the systems, it's not in the processes, it's not easily transferred. It's what people have learned over the last two decades of their job. And so that knowledge transfer needs to be something that we'll have a recommendation about that. Okay, Becca, let's go to some of the data. So if you look at this chart, your average retirement age is 62 and a half. And you can see how it starts to shape up. 105 people approaching that pretty quickly. And I think about 132 people on the right side of the chart. Go to the next slide, Becca. So here you'll see that the top, this is where you're at today, 2021. About 30% of your current population is either at, over, or nearing the retirement age. 14% are at or above it. And 16% are quickly approaching it, certainly within the next five years. And many of them, that largest chunk, within the next couple of years. We know about 2026, four years away, that those numbers increase dramatically. And so the number of people that will be at or above the retirement age, given just the current state, almost half your workforce, 45% of your workforce. Again, and so when you have a department of one or a department of one or two, that's a lot of impact that the county is going to be experiencing. Becca, go to the next page. So we talked about this and, you know, 
Uh, you're not alone in this regard. This isn't uh, an issue that's unique to, to Carroll County. This is a, a, a problem that every organization uh, in the country is experiencing. Uh, and if they're not, um, they've got you know, some magic wand, but very few have. Uh, almost everybody is really experiencing that. So, um, you know, what's compounding the issue here is you're trying to play catch up. And so significant vacancies across the county exist, and we have some, some data and some numbers around that, um, and a lack of competitiveness in attracting recruiting, recruiting talent, uh, contributing to the ability to, the inability to fill the roles. So, um, you know, Ted, Ted mentioned it in his comments, but, you know, you, you do have a, a low competitive um, compensation structure, uh, which makes it difficult to recruit people. Um, and again, in the, in the in the reason I spent the minutes on talking about the national labor shortage uh, is you're competing for talent um, in, in an era where people are making uh, job choices based on uh, compensation and other uh, variables. And again, you're competing for millennials uh, for the most part uh, who are gonna be looking at, at, uh, at compensation levels and you're, and you're low there. Um, so you're seeing it, um, I think you all uh, comment about it. Um, you know, the candidate pools are low. Some of that can be attributed to your recruiting processes. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, but others are um, really around this um, area of two things, what we would call compensation number one, but also what we have in the bottom of the page, what we, we generally refer to as an employee value proposition, kind of some fancy consultant words there. But what it really means is, um, What's the message that you're really selling to attract people to both stay at the county, uh, but to come and work at the county? What is it good? Why, you know, tell me why this would be a good place to work. Um, yeah, compensation is part of it. What are the other attributes? Um, and so when, when you ask people, what, what is that employee value proposition today? What are the compelling reasons why somebody would want to come to work here? Um, that story gets a little blur and uh, people aren't able to articulate it. And, and so I think they're feeling the pain of that, that we need to improve that story. And, and there are some things, I talked about the benefits, there are some other great things about working at the county, uh, but finding that, that storyline and, and using that to work with people uh, will be uh, important. The remote and flexible work options, um, clearly impacting uh, recruiting talent. I don't know if you, any of you saw the uh, the woman from LinkedIn who was on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, but she had a staggering data point. Um, and you know, LinkedIn does a lot of uh, analysis around recruiting and does a lot of recruiting through through LinkedIn. And um, the data point that they gave was that pre-pandemic, uh, that one in 67 jobs uh, had a remote or flexible option to it. Um, and that post-pandemic, um, that number is now one in seven. So it's gone from one to 67 down to, to one in seven. So again, um, hard to do and challenging to do, but uh, we know, and you look at that data point I gave about why millennials are leaving their job, uh, it's remote and flexible work option was the number two reason. Becca, go ahead. So turnover, um, we know that uh, there's been some, uh, some uh, significant turnover at the county. Um, so your average turnover rates are about are about 10%. Um, I guess that's okay. Um, you know, uh, other other uh, it, it's probably okay in today's environment. Um, some organizations are experiencing higher than that. You have about two percent involuntary turnover; those are being asked to leave, uh, and about eight percent uh, people just resign. Um, you have several departments that are over that 10%, and so you see some of them: um, public works, in particular, public safety. Uh, we're uh, greater than 10% uh, turnover. So um, we didn't talk to people that had left. Uh, it'd be about another analysis of understanding that, um, understanding kind of the exit interview stuff, but um, we can guess um, what some of the issues are. Um, some of it could be uh, workload, uh, some of it could be pay, um, some of it could be uh, working conditions. So all of those probably, and then just competition, right? they're probably getting uh, offers to, to go elsewhere. Um, go to the next page, Becca. So uh, a, a number of comments and themes that we saw around uh, just how people are feeling, right? Just kind of what's the morale? Um, again, we talked to 123 people, so uh, we, had a, we, had a, we had a good sense of this and, and people wanted to talk about it. 
you know, we, we would sometimes just ask people in general, but in a, in a very unaided way, people wanted to talk to us about uh, morale. Um, and so it was generally described as well. Um, and so that translates to low employee engagement. And, and when you have low employee engagement, you have low levels of productivity. Uh, people just don't work as hard um, or as fast. Um, and so that has a corresponding impact on service quality, service issues, um, and, and creates the, an inefficient uh, um, organizational environment. We talked about compensation, we talked about flexible work. Um, some employees, many employees said to us they feel unappreciated for their contributions. Um, they, they said, you know, we don't, there's, we, we couldn't find a, um, you know, what we would call a, uh, you know, employee or a robust employee recognition uh, program. Um, you know, how are people recognized either publicly or, you know, in both financial and non-financial ways. Um, people like to be told they're doing a good job. And so um, people are feeling I think a bit unappreciated for the work. And particularly again, in an environment where they believe uh, they're operating with a hundred fewer um, physicians uh, than they had uh, prior to 2009 um, and not getting the, the recognition for that. Um, so we saw, um, you know, while there's generally believed that benefits are good, um, those will those will be um, um, hard sells, uh, harder sell for a younger generation, and Gen Z and Gen and millennials in particular, um, who aren't as interested in the benefits or pension benefits, I should say, um, when choosing jobs. They're interested in pay, um, you know, shorter term, shorter term. Um, uh, gains. Now, we also saw, um, you know, people wanted to talk about morale and culture around, um, I don't feel like I'm going anywhere. I'm not being developed. Uh, my career development is limited, um, not limited training. Um, and so one of the things we know from our work is that millennial and Gen Z in particular, uh, they want to have defined career paths. Um, and they want to know you're investing in me, you care about me, and I'm going to have professional growth here. Um, I'm going to learn more. I'm going to uh, advance my own personal and, and professional um, competencies. Um, so hard to find that in any meaningful way going on in the county today. And again, not because people aren't interested or don't want to do it. I just don't think you have the resources or um, have an aligned investments to do it. Um, you've heard about paid maternity and paternity leave benefits, um, uh, you know, interest among. Uh, we see that again, you know, as in more progressive organizations that are are looking for, um, uh, you know, child care support, uh, child care support. Let me just make a comment about that. Um, I meant to make this in my op opening uh, remarks. Um, hats off to you commissioners for doing this study. Uh, I do think that uh, the most uh, progressive and uh, the organizations that are paying attention to these issues the most are doing this kind of thing, are looking at the issues are challenging themselves to think about these or asking hard questions. So credit, uh, credit to you as commissioners for doing it. Uh, many aren't doing it, and they're, they're not burying their head on the sand, uh, but to some degree they are, um, and ignoring the reality. So credit to you for uh, um, having the wherewithal to even be doing the, the study in the first place. If, I, <laughs> if I may, Mr. Nastasia, thanks for recognizing that. I remember two years ago when we first went into the pandemic policies and how we had so much off-site employment, I had sent the email to both the HR director and the county administrator recommending that this is a prime opportunity for us to reevaluate and assess what it means to have employees and what type of benefits they have. So I am ecstatic with this, so thank you. You're welcome, and you know, congratulations for even raising it then, you know, uh, you were ahead of the curve. Um, more, more and more organizations every day are kind of waking up to this. Um, and again, um, credit to you for uh, being ahead of, ahead of the curve and um, having the forethought to do it. Thank you. Um, back on my page uh, 19 here, so um, you go into this page. Um, I won't go into these details, but you know, there's a number of things in your charter, uh, in your personnel policies that, again, these are sort of details, I'm happy to share them uh, but this level probably not all that interesting to you but there's a number of things that probably just limit again your ability to attract and, and retain people um, again Jim just picking one um, 
you know, you have a, you have an interesting tuition assistance policy, um, um, but it's got a really low reimbursement amount. Um, you've got uh, this, this policy in place where you've got to start your starting salaries have to be are, are really low and you have really limited flexibility and uh, offering positions that are higher than uh, some really minimum threshold. So um, a whole host of technical things here that I, that I won't spend a lot of time on, but all of these are either impacting uh, retention or culture um, or your ability to recruit. Um, so uh, as Ted mentioned, um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of folks wanted to talk about HR um, and uh, see HR as a bit of an impediment, as a barrier. Um, to progress. Um, some of it in their defense may be, um, again, some uh, inability to, to invest appropriately and sufficiently in the area. Um, but HR was generally characterized as a uh, very compliance or organization, compliance oriented organization, very rigid, risk averse, and flexible. Um, and, and we get it, um, you know, governments uh, tend to be that, but um, you have the opportunity to change that, I think. And, um, you know, the best HR organizations on the planet um, are doing things that are just the opposite of those things, that they have flexibility, they're, you know, they're, they're taking managed risk, um, they have flexibility. Um, so, um, you know, HR is seen as a, as a bit of a, a, a barrier here. Um, they're perceived as lacking of service orientation and not focusing on people and culture. Uh, again, focusing on sort of process and rules and, and compliance. Um, so, uh, you know, just worth noting, uh, we share a lot of this detail uh, you know, with, uh, with Ted and Roberta. Uh, um, okay, I'll go to the next page. Uh, I won't go into this detail, but um, just a quick summary is that if, if you look at, you know, the, the HR organizations and the best HR organizations, what, what should they be really working and looking at? The model on the left, um, what you call a best practice model, has a, an appropriate balance between things that we would say are strategic, um, things that are consultative, and things that are administrative. Um, and strategic are like our succession planning, our workforce planning, leadership development, our compensation strategy, what are we doing about diversity, what are we doing about HR metrics, um, consultative, how are we really you know, manager and employee relations, recruitment, um, performance mm -hmm. management, and administrative. At Carroll County, um, if you look at all of the things that are going on in HR, both in terms of activities and your resources and investments, <coughs> the chart looks a little bit like it on the right and, and this might be even an exaggeration of strategic. It might be even smaller than that. So uh, very little strategic, some consultative, but largely uh, an administrative uh, compliance organization. Go ahead. So uh, as Ted mentioned, you know, we uh, we did identify some opportunities for restructuring. Uh, it's important to note, though, that um, a lot of these, or uh, some of these, will be dependent on investment or, or technology. Um, some can be done after <coughs> those things. Um, but, but let me run through where, where we saw some, uh, um, some short-term opportunities. So you got uh, uh, both planning function and the land and resource management function. Um, those aren't integrated today. Um, they have very similar missions, um, and they could be co combined into a single unit, which which we believe, um, and I think they believe as well, uh, would uh, uh, provide a more integrated approach to both long-term planning strategy um, and addressing short-term priorities and activities. Public Works is a huge organization, uh, large and complex. Um, probably uh, the size of it is preventing barriers to good operational efficiency. So there might be a way to restructure that. You might take facilities out or consider taking facilities out, making its own unit um, in, into a standalone uh, unit. Um, parks and recreation facilities, again, fragmented, kind of um, doing uh, similar things at times, uh, not aligning or integrating their activities. There's opportunities to uh, improve that. Uh, I mentioned uh, you know, EMS earlier. Uh, EMS model, um, public safety, that has, I think, an opportunity for better upgrade, uh, uh, integration alignment. Uh, grants administration, highly distributed, decentralized across the county. Um, it, it, you know, uh, leading to duplication of effort. 
in inefficiencies, uh, both in structure and a lot of manual processes that uh, being some opportunity to gain some efficiencies and some organizational improvement. Your administrative support function, um, again, largely decentralized, uh, uh, different responsibilities, um, uneven level of support that's given. Um, and so another area where it might be an opportune, opportunity for centralization or consolidation. Uh, your GIS, uh, again, decentralized, um, probably an area you want to centralize and coordinate better the technologies or uh, and just the roles uh, lend themselves to, to, to greater efficiencies. Go ahead, Dr. Some areas that we thought might, might be a little overstaffed, collections, um, the, the administrative support roles. Um, again, um, hard to really identify um, whether they are or not because so, many, so much of the work is manual in nature. Um, you know, a lot, some of the overstaffing in the areas are driven because you're processing paper. Um, so inefficiencies there. Some areas where you might be understaffed, we believe, um, your IT or technology services area. Um, you know, I heard you all talking about uh, you know, cybersecurity. Um, that's gonna continue to be a challenge uh, for every entity. Um, you know, technology advances and your ability to deploy technology to, to transact uh, with your customer base, um, with your citizens, um, and then it just internally is going to increase um, just naturally. And so having a, a good, solid, robust uh, technology unit um, is really critical, I think, for the future success of the organization. Uh, fire and EMS, uh, we know that there's they're under you know, 200 uh, employees that they're trying to hire. Um, and so actual staffing requirements or resources not re really known. Uh, again, we sort of took a high level look at that. Um, roads operations, we know there's 17 or more positions that are currently open. Um, and that's been kind of uh, going on for a while. And, um, and then some ro roles in uh, facilities and maintenance. Go ahead, Becca. I mentioned technology, um, can't underscore this enough. Um, you know, the systems are really dated. Um, your technology platforms um, are an impediment to gaining our operational efficiencies, um, you know, leading again to manual um, paper um, slow processes. So slower transaction times. Um, and I can imagine, you know, I, what, I, what I always say um, to my clients is that you're, you'll, you'll see it among your workforce and among your clients. Is, is the impact of consumer technology. And what I mean by that is um, the more that all of us become familiar with the um, ability of our phones uh, to transact things in our personal lives. So we can go to Amazon, we can, you know, we can book a trip, we can order our groceries, we can get an Uber, um, all the things that our phones can do, um, people wanna intersect and interact with the county in the same way. Um, they want to be able to look things up and get quick access to data, simple, easy, just-in-time information and data, um, difficult uh, to do now. Um, so antiquated systems require paper manual uh, processes, which requires higher staff, you need more staff to do it. Um, so you, you have that uh, going on uh, throughout the county. Uh, so lack of systems, lack of automation, grants administration was identified as an area uh, with a lot of uh, manual work um, again, creating, uh, quite frankly, uh, some risk and vulnerability because the more you are engaged in these manual processes, the more opportunity there is for error, um, human error. Um, so, uh, let's make, you know, comment process efficiencies and automation would reduce, uh, you know, eliminate our, our need for more staffing. Um, and so, uh, we'll go to the next page. Some other uh, comments. Um, on the technology front. Document management, how are you just even managing documents, sharing information, sharing documents, uh, very inefficient um, across the county. Um, have a heavily, uh, heavy reliance on individual spreadsheets, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheets to manage most processes or many processes. Again, what's happening there is that people are creating their own processes to transact work. Um, and then just storing information, either on their computers or file cabinets or, uh, but again, not in a systemic way, um, use of common technology. So it creates um, security, data security risks. 
Um, I mentioned you know, technology services, perceived as being other staff, overwhelmed. Um, so I think the rest of it is pretty much uh, technology training. Um, just the last point of age there. Um, you know, people want to know more. Um, I think you have some capability in your systems today uh, that you could be leveraging your technology to, to a greater extent. Um, but some, in some cases, people don't even know how to use the technology that's in front of them. You see that comment um, in uh, older workforces um, that have been around a while. Um, so you have some of that going on. Um, but um, another opportunity uh, uh, to gain some, some efficiencies for better use of technology. Go ahead, Becca. Okay, so those are our, our, our findings. Um, and I think I'll just keep going unless anybody has any comments, but I'll run through our, our recommendations and um, and, uh, and then take take a slew of questions, I'm sure, as, as we, uh, unless anybody wants to make a comment before. Uh, okay. So, do you have uh, any, uh, you mentioned here um, inefficiencies, I guess, with um, uh, permits process. The Excel program, was that brought up in your study? That was implemented in the county, I, I think, several years ago. It should be, I mean, that mapping and review should be in place. Would, Jen, did you, did you hear anything about that? Um, I think, you know, we heard mention of it, but I think just the broader processes and workflows among many of these areas, including permits, it, you know, just still opportunities for streamlining, automation, just looking at the layers. So um, I think just more broadly, you know, probably more work to be done there in terms of gaining, you know, deeper and broader kinds of efficiencies, particularly in local processes. Anything else? So let me, let me, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, go ahead, thank you. So we had, we had five thematic recommendations and in the same fashion, uh, each of these has a sufficient uh, amount of detail behind them. But, but let, me, let me review for you the, um, the five key uh, thematic uh, recommendations. So the, the first one is, um, is, is, is to engage in a, a comprehensive planning effort um, to develop that, that vision and strategy to guide the county's priorities and investments over the next five years. And as I think Commissioner Boucher mentioned, this this might be an opportunity to do before, uh, you know, the end of uh, your term this year. You know, it's um, it would require an effort, um, but um, it might be a nice legacy thing that uh, you could build for the county for years to come. Is to get your arms around where are we really headed here and how are we going to address these issues. So, talk more about that. But our recommendation is to do that. Just engage in a in a planning effort that says. Here's where we're headed over the next five years. Here's our challenges, um, and here's how we're going to address them. I, I believe um, you made a very, very good point because I think we are more suited to take this on than the new board. I know I had my sea legs my first year in office. It would have been very difficult for me as a new rookie county commissioner to even dig into something like this. So I think it is best suited for us with our experience and tenure to dig into this. I agree with that, Commissioner. And you know, I, I, my fear for you as a county is that, um, to your point, um, I know you're going to have some significant turnover in your commissioners this year or into next year. But you're right. Um, you know, a, a new uh, set of commissioners coming on board next year. Um, you're going to be. You're already behind. Um, and you know, these challenges aren't going to get any easier. Um, they're in front of you now. And um, you know, waiting another year or two years. Um, and trying to get a, a, a plan in place um, that addresses these issues, I think it will put you further behind. Um, so that'll be something you all decide, but certainly our recommendation would be to accelerate that and keep that in, in front of yourselves as, a, as an opportunity um, here over the uh, ensuing months. Uh, a second recommendation is, um, is to really develop a plan to get after the succession, uh, recognizing that even with a, a, a clear vision and plan to move forward, um, you're still going to have, because of the retirements, you're going to still have a, a fair amount of turnover. Um, you'll see it. Um, and so, you know, whether that's uh, the full 45% in the next three years, four years, um, you'll be close to that. Um, and so that's a lot of knowledge. And so um, ensuring that you're addressing that 
And then also the recruiting and retention challenges. Um, Succession's only going to get you so far. Um, you know, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to. That might get you some knowledge transfer, but you're going to have to bring people in. Um, and then retention. One of the things I, I tell my clients almost every day is that in this current uh, work environment, um, environment, uh, you know, employment environment, um, you have to have an obsession with retention. You have to keep your good people. Um, and so building good strategies and plans to, to make that happen will be a, a key recommendation. Um, we, we make a recommendation about implementing some of the staffing and organizational changes, but I'll provide some detail around that. And then getting your arms around this, this technology piece. Um, again, um, I think you're behind the curve here. Um, it requires some investment. There's some things you could do now. Uh, but, but really advancing and accelerating your technology is only going to serve the county and its uh, citizens for years to come in a good way. Um, and then identify or establish what are the resources and skills and competencies that uh, we need to implement the plan. Um, so let me talk about each of these. Go ahead, Becca. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, the first the first recommendation is to engage in this uh, strategic planning effort. And what we say is establish a, a vision and strategic plan for the county that'll serve as a foundation for future priorities and investments. And to do so, engage the commissioners, the five commissioners and the county directors uh, in identifying the vision. So really a, a, a collaborative uh, effort between the, the key directors of the county and the commissioners to come together um, in probably a facilitated way, um, bring you all together to do that. Um, identify, you know, what are our imperatives? Uh, imperatives is a word that we often use in our planning to say, you know, it, what are the five to 10 things that we just absolutely have to get right in order to be successful to, to meet our mission? Um, you'll be able to do that. Um, and so identifying what those imperatives are and then building specific actions and activities for achieving those, uh, those imperatives. Um, and then incorporating, of course, um, you know, a, a, a costing analysis, what will it cost to do, where will the resources come from, how are we going to fund it, um, and um, that becomes the basis of a plan. Um, but uh, along with that, you know, we, we'll, we have a roadmap here at the end of the plan, um, at the end of our report, but developing an implementation plan with timelines. We know that whatever plan you come up with, uh, you're not going to be able to walk in the following Monday morning and turn on a light switch and get them all done. Uh, it'll take time. Um, we, we've recommended a, a set of activities that'll span a three-year horizon. Um, so you'll want to do the same, right? Thinking about an implementation plan. What can we do this year? What can we do next year? What can we do the following year? But a plan, a structured plan, will allow you to get to a, a shared uh, point of, of the future. I mentioned the funding plan a, a requirement. Um, and then, um, you know, a, a establish a, an approach among the commissioners and candidates for doing that. Again, is it facilitated? Do you do this in some, you know, how do you, how do you get that done? Uh, we can give you some advice and direction and guidance around that. Um, and then what we said both in a strategic way is really consider um, uh, engaging a deputy director role for the county administrator. Um, it, it, at some point, um, the county administrator has to be a strategic leader of the organization. Uh, and as long as she is sucked into the day-to-day -day operations, um, that's going to be that's going to prevent that from happening. So, uh, we think a, one of the recommendations as part of advancing the strategy uh, is saddling the organization with a, a number two to the county administrator. Go ahead, Becca. Um, as we say here, develop you know targeted plans for succession, recruiting, retention. Um, you know, developing a comprehensive talent strategy and, and, and plan and, and, and address workflow challenges. So starting with a, a succession plan as part of your talent strategy. So what we mean by talent strategy is to say, hey, look, you know, what, what does our workforce look like over the next five years? We know that uh, certain of our leaders, we can build succession. And so we're going to, you know, the new uh, leader of this organization is going to come from here. The new leader of that organization is going to come from here. Um, and so succession will get us so far, but you'll also need to understand how many roles will we need to uh, 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 fill through recruitment. And so then building a pipeline around recruitment and how many roles will we need to retain and what are we gonna do to retain people? So the details here, I don't need to go into all of them, really tell that story. So building a succession planning model where um, you recognize uh, in a formal way, um, how are we going to start transferring knowledge to um, the leaders across our organization? Or, and you may not be leaders, you could be profession and your skilled trades. 
a super hard job to recruit for in any environment now. So how do we train the next level of skilled technicians out in our facilities groups and, and other uh, critical elements? So um, all of that is uh, to say, really build a, a succession plan and understanding what that model, model looks like. So next page, Becca. Um, knowledge transfer is very similar kind of approach here, but recognizing that most of the knowledge in key roles across the county today uh, resides in the heads of one or two individuals. And so finding a way to extract that knowledge from their heads um, into systems, into documented process, into tools, um, and then teaching people um, through a very structured mentoring, shadowing, apprentice programs, um, other areas and efforts um, you know, will need to be done. Right back up. So um, training and development, again, another part of the sort of talent strategy. How do we build more skills of people? So we want to transfer knowledge. We want to identify people who are success to be successors. But how do we build skills? How do we get more technology skills? How do we uh, train people to be new leaders? How do we get, get the new competencies to manage a, a new workforce that's going to have a whole bunch of crazy demands? How do you manage, a, if you go remote, how do you manage remote workers and hybrid work team? Um, so that requires some training and investment in, in training and development. So um, a, a number of recommendations for how to, how to engage in a training and development uh, strategy. Go ahead, Becca. And then, and then recruiting. Again, in your talent plan, a number of those positions, no matter what you do internally, both in training and succession planning and mentoring and apprentice, you still need to recruit new people uh, into the organization. So um, you'll need to do that in a new way. Um, your current recruiting strategy and efforts uh, will not be sufficient. And so um, thinking about um, how do we build new pipelines for hard to fill roles? How do we create partnerships with high school, with uh, Carroll County Community College? Um, how do we develop a workforce development, continuing education programs? Uh, what about in internships, apprenticeships? How do we expand our networks, um, doing educational events? Um, tapping into the community um, to showcase uh, Carroll County as an employer, targeted job fairs, outreach campaigns, using social media as a recruiting strategy, um, the employee referral program. So a number of recommendations here to build a more robust uh, recruiting strategy. Dr. Go ahead. Staying on recruiting, um, I talked about that employee value proposition, but you'll want to get that right. Why do people want to come uh, to work here? So starting to understand and define that and then marketing that and, and telling people that. So, um, you know, fair and consistent policies, effective leadership, flexible work options, career development, growth, um, some of the things you see on the uh, bottom of the page um, could be potential components of a, of a, a future uh, employee value proposition. Go ahead. Um, and then, you know, you're going to have to think about your HR organization of the future. Um, once you're, you've got it, you know, you, you, you know, if you're going to have more robust planning and succession planning and recruitment, uh, probably some changes in, in HR. Um, and so, thinking about restructuring and reimagining what the HR organization looks like will be important. Go ahead, Becca. Talking about about culture, um, as we as we mentioned, culture, morale, uh, generally low. Um, so some, some specific recommendations there. We, we do think you'll need to address some of these compensation issues, uh, particularly as you start to recruit in more uh, uh, millennials um, that aren't going to be as attractive to the pension uh, benefit. Uh, they'll be looking more uh, astutely at, at compensation. Um, so a, a number of things you'll see here in terms of uh, getting that. And, and the, the, re the second half of the single work is really around compensation. So you'll get a lot of specific recommendations. A different team of folks will, will be working on it. Go ahead, Becca. We think that uh, you know there's value in um, regularly doing an employee engagement survey, understanding you know where are we at today. You know we say establish a baseline. Uh, you know we've got this story to tell. We know it, but even understanding on a, on a um, metric basis and a data basis, you know where are we at today, and and how do people feel about us as an organization. Um, and then using that on a regular basis to move the bar higher. What are the issues that uh, will make this a great place to work? And again, 
uh, if you if you adopt that notion that we have to have an uh, obsession with retention, um, you want to know what's important to employees. Um, I won't go into this. But this goes to the you know a number of sort of details around some of your complex personnel policies, but some recommendations for improving those, making them more attractive to both your workers and, and future workers. Next page. <clears throat> so total rewards. We know that the compensation work that's going on, we'll, we'll look at all of this, but it's really important to take a step back and say, what what is the, what are those package of things that we're um, offering to our, uh, our workers, our employees and our future employees that make them want to come here, stay here. And so it's not just your paycheck, but what is that, the overall reward structure that's in place? So, you know, voluntary benefits, flexible work, maternity leave, you know, these are some things that we're seeing in, in other organizations, not recommending them necessarily, but things to think about. Child care supplements, tuition benefits, wellness programs, recognition programs, stress reduction. You know, these are what modern contemporary employers are thinking about, uh, again, in this, in this uh, arms race for talent. Um, the kinds of things that others are thinking about. Okay, go ahead, Becca. Um, remote and flexible work, um, you have to think about this. Um, not easy, I know, and it's not available for everybody. I know some shifts just, you, you can't be out there and on the road. And so um, it's not for everybody, but um, really thinking about what is our remote hybrid work strategy. We know that, you know, if you take that, that LinkedIn data, one in seven jobs today are offering a remote or hybrid uh, work option. Um, there's also a sort of an interesting issue going on around workers' compensation coverage for those employees that you have that work in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, if anybody wants any details about that, I know Jan or Becca can uh, spend details, but we made a recommendations for sort of improving that, if you will. Go ahead, Becca. Um, as I mentioned before, a new generation of workers want to see um, evidence that they'll have an opportunity to, to grow their careers. Um, and that may be by level and promotion, uh, but it, it could also just be in terms of the knowledge that they gain in their job. So developing you know, what are called career paths or ladders, how do you uh, elevate yourself through a career uh, will be important in, um, in, again, telling that story to a new generation of workers. Um, and then probably bolstering your performance management program. Know that I think you have marginal um, clients with people really getting performance management. We know in particular millennial generation, Gen Z, they want uh, constant and regular uh, feedback on their performance. Um, and so you'll need to get better at this um, as time goes on. Um, a num I won't go through these again, a number of sort of policy changes, all sort of technical in nature, which we think will help both the recruiting and retention things. Um, probably minor fixes, but uh, uh, things that are probably impediments within your uh, policies today. But go ahead, Becca. We can go past this because it's an example. Um, so, uh, so our next recommendation is really is is uh, this fourth one, which is you know implement staffing and organizational changes and uh, realignments to uh, gain organizational operational efficiency. So we talked about some of these um, some areas where you have some staffing needs. So we talked about the deputy director. We think there's got to be a, a priority on your roads staff. Um, so there's, I think, 17 open positions there today. Um, that needs some attention, so I recommend getting after that rather quickly. Um, additional staffing priorities, um, again, this could be all within the context of a broader strategic plan, but clearly your technology services, the, the, the HR has got to be sort of rethought and reimagined, and then even grants management. Um, and then we also did a staffing model, which we're not going to share it today, but we'll make sure that you have it uh, that will uh, shows predicted turnover and um, other staffing elements in, in great detail. Um, some other thoughts around organizational restructuring and alignment. We talked about these uh, in the review, so we'll go into great detail. But again, consider merging planning uh, and land resource management. I think there's opportunities to do that. Think about restructuring your public works and transitioning maybe the facilities unit out. Um, creating a general services unit, uh, revising that grants management structure, uh, streamlining your administrative support, probably consolidating the 
and then you know, even think about centralized or consolidated GIS function code vector. Might be some outsourcing opportunities. Um, we at high level talked about fire EMS, um, didn't get into great detail or conversation about it. we know it was new, uh, but you know, it's always an opportunity as you know, in a cost constrained environment. So something should be thought of. Go ahead, Becca. Um, talking about process redesign and automation. Um, you know, uh, easy to say, not easy to do, um, but you know, getting after this, um, automating those processes that are resulting in extra staffing levels, and slow response times to uh, even to your you know core functions to your community um, need to happen, um, and so. We think that there's a, there's a series of pro recommendations here to document your processes. And if you go through an exercise of process redesign, uh, where you map them to we use a, the, what we call swimming process mapping, identifying you know areas and activities that either can be automated or completely eliminated. Uh, what we always find is that the pro inefficient processes are straddled with years of sort of bureaucracy and mess. And so how do we get those out of the system and, and take those out? Um, and so uh, we said, you know, launch or commission a formal effort to do just that. So go ahead, that's the next thing. Um, areas that we thought would be probably in a priority, prioritized way, um, grants management, uh, the administrative support permits, uh, recruiting and hiring, classification promotion, finance and accounting, all of these are sort of areas that are um, impeded by uh, inefficient processes, manual processes, low use of technology, automation. Go ahead, Becca. Okay, then I talked about um, you know, technology. Um, again, not an easy thing to do, um, but what, what we see in, in organizations that do this well is they create what they call an IT governance model. So. They're thinking about it. They're developing a strategic plan uh, and a roadmap for IT investments. Um, and so, again, recognizing that you're not going to do this all at once, but in kind of a strategic plan for IT um, as part of your overall uh, planning efforts. Um, on the bottom of the page, you know, we, we, we document we, we talked about some areas that are in, in a critical need of uh, technology upgrades, automation. So, your document management. Uh, grants management, online collections, um, HR, um, uh, and then some of the just outdated programming languages uh, that have gone away you know, in some organizations a couple of decades ago. Uh, go ahead, Becca. Um, you know, we know that funding investment, um, you get, you're going to have to pay for this. So again, part of the planning effort, um, understanding what those what those investments look like. Again, the knowing you can't do it overnight, but how do you project this out over a, a multi-year period uh, probably required. Go ahead, Becca. Um, we say here, just in, in terms of, you know, in resources, roles, skills, and competencies, um, you know, HR and IT, um, you know, again, we think they're sort of the competencies in those area both need to be sort of elevated and expanded. Um, <laughs> so, um, you want to pay particular attention to that. And we've got some recommendations about how to put that for them. Um, and then some specifics on the next page here, Becca. Um, you know, future HR capabilities, um, you know, all the things we talked about. Um, you, you, you all were bold enough to get to this point. Uh, the next bold step will be now we're doing it. Um, and so, you know, making sure that we have um, a talent plan in place, with strategic plan in place, or acquire, you know, the different kind of HR organizations and IT organizations today. And so on our last page, a lot of words here, but um, as I mentioned, we tried to recognize that, you know, where do you even start? Um, and um, we had a lot of recommendations in there. And so what we tried to do was to create a roadmap um, that identifies a three-year uh, progression of billing uh, on uh, each successive year. Um, and so year one, you see number one item, share the report with commissioners, doing that today. Uh, and then almost immediately develop and launch a strategic planning effort. Um, that's where it starts. Um, let's get consensus, let's get a plan in place, 
um, then all the things that go, you know, secure funding, identify the succession plan, do our IT and HR competency plan, think about the remote work, our IT planning effort, what are we going to do about fire and EMS, um, more HR transformation ideas, um, that common class which is coming, um, start some of that process mapping um, uh, and expanding your total rewards and benefits, really building that employee, employee value proposition, um, and then um, really developing a strategic recruiting plan. That's a pretty big lift in a year. Uh, but then building upon that in year two where you're now implementing a succession plan, you're now doing training, you're building you know, more tools, um, and so on. By year three, now you're now you're fully implementing your succession plan, you're completing your technology. So it shows you again progressive uh, uh, implementation and support. And so with that, that's that is our plan. We have an appendix with a number of materials, including um, uh, the, the staffing plan. But um, let's stop sharing there, Becca, and um, take any comments, questions, or. Um, any other, any other thing that we can address? Scott, I appreciate, uh, and your entire team, the effort so far. Um, what you shared with us in a relatively short amount of time, a lot of information for us to digest and uh, think through uh, amongst ourselves and with our team. You know, looking at the uh, thematic, uh, you know, verticals, you know, the, the vision strategy, workforce structure, and then technology, you know, is a good way to package it, and then we can take a look at this. Um, it kind of makes me think of, you know, the id ego, super ego, you know, throw it all out there without any restraints, and then have all restraints, which we're going to be walking through in a few weeks as we walk through the budget, and then balancing all of that together to meeting our community needs, um, and how to be not just effective, but efficient moving forward because that's really what we're talking about is how do we balance our effects and our efficiencies together uh, for a healthy Carroll County government to meet the needs of Carroll Countyans. Um, I think uh, personally I appreciate the work you've done so far. Um, it ain't an end state, it's a journey and you're on the journey with us. Um, so I really do have confidence in that as well. Um, Great information, and great information again, you know, parroting uh, Commissioner Wentz, we do not do this behind closed doors. We do this out there, and I just ask that folks who are listening, who are capturing this information, do not jump to a conclusion because of one bullet point, because it's going to inevitably not be tied to the resources necessary, and you know, it's, it has to all be looked at in its in its total. Um, we have to be responsible and mature not to look at one bullet point. I ask the community to do the same, but we all work together, uh, and we're always available for the community to uh, to f f go down further down the road with this information. So you laid it out really well. Um, are there any other comments, uh, Dennis? Anything? Uh, just a lot of information, and um, it all looks like really good information just gonna take a lot of time to process and go over it and reread I pulled like five or ten pages to the side which I want to go over again a second time with, you know, that kind of thing before I can actually melt it down into <laughs> to my brain to figure out what what I, I see what your steps are but I have to put in my process what my next steps would be really appreciate it though Commissioner Wentz no just to thank you again uh, great information uh, some of this information that we received today are things that some of us talked about previously mm -hmm. so that's interesting yeah. too uh, and I appreciate that being brought to the to, mm -hmm. to light because in, in an organization such as ours when one brings something up others will look and go well wait a minute what are you doing again but we that that'll help in the process so I appreciate it uh, we do have a lot of work to do I think it's going to be uh, something that's that's going to be very challenging for us to do because now we have to, to, to try to go to work with this with limited staff anyway so it's sort of a catch-22 if you will um, so we'll, we'll do the best we can to try to implement as much of this as we as we can I'm a little challenged by uh, the timing here I wish we would have done this three years ago 
because it's hard to set strategic goals and plans when there's new people coming in in just a very short period of time. And it almost gets to a point where it's a little bit on the verge of disrespectful because you're sort of telling the new folks that are going to be here soon that we want them to do this. So that's going to be interesting too. Um, I've got a little bit of a challenge with that. So, uh, but all in all, the information and the way in which you acquired it, I, I truly do appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, we got work to do. Yeah, we're gonna have to look at the timing. Like yeah, you the said. timing's important. I, and I, I, I yeah. also look forward to the rest because I know yeah. there's compensation coming, mm -hmm. which is critically important uh, so that we can marry all this together. Uh, but there's, there's just, I, I love the information. There's just mm -hmm. a few things on my mind that make me go, yeah, I'm not sure that that's going to work, but we'll we'll see where we go. So. I think we should blame Ted for not getting it done three years earlier. Exactly. But, you know, or that last group yeah. of commissioners should have done it too. They should have. Well, I don't you know, know about them. Blame Whatever. Mike. <laughs> okay, Commissioner <laughs> Weaver. Uh, can't argue with anything you presented today. I think in our back of our minds we kind of know it, but as we get into dealing with government, we kind of, well, we'll deal with that later, we'll forget about this, or it gets forgotten. Uh, sometimes uh, we forget about the changing workforce, mm -hmm. the change we have to make to keep up. I mean, you get into the same old rut that, you know, if we've been doing it this way, we continue it doing it this way, and we forget about the, uh, I guess, the mindset in the workplace, how the workplace is changing, what we're going to have to do to get to that point. Um, we do need efficiencies, uh, and technology is part of that. And uh, I made the comment on Excel. I know we worked on this years ago. I thought that was implemented better than what it is now, because that way, that was an efficiency that should be uh, really help uh, maybe even uh, reduce work staff in some areas. And I'm not sure how it's actually working. I've seen some of it. Um, but you, you gave us a lot of information. The biggest factor is we have to act on it. The fact that we went through this, if we don't take this plan and actually dissect it, go through step by step, we, ha we haven't done a thing. And um, this is why we did it. And I'm firmly uh, convinced that we need, I don't care if it's this board, the next board, mm -hmm. keep looking at this uh, report, go back to it, and start to look at each aspect of it and make changes where we need to in our government. Uh, I, I was really impressed. Thank you. Turning an assessment into an action plan. Absolutely right. Commissioner Boucher. Yes. Mr. Nostalgia, I want to thank you and your staff for all the work you put into this. It's a lot of administrative science stuff to go through. And the best simplistic terms I can give the public out there is think of the county as a work truck. It's still running, but you know you got a bearing going out and you can hear it. It keeps running. That bearing eventually don't go out and you don't be broke down unless you take the time and get the mechanic to fix that bearing. And that's, I think, precisely where we're at as a county. We need to fix that bearing that's going out. Also, I remember when I first came on board, Commissioner Frazier said, Eric, being a county commissioner when we first come on board is like drinking out of a fire hose. Well, this report is going to be like drinking out of a fire hose. And we don't collectively have all the ability to solve this, but with the help of our staff, who has a lot of responsibility in this, we're going to be able to pull this off. I want to give special recognition to Director Ted Zaleski because I believe he is truly a champion of this. I think he's got more insight in how this county government is run than anyone else in this building. And the fact that he is on board with this is a tremendous asset to, leader, to be a leader and guide us in this. So thank you very much. Okay. Anything else from uh, the cheap seats? Go yeah, ahead, just Ted. I wanted to <laughs> follow up on one thing Commissioner Weaver said. We talked about the possibility of technology allowing us to reduce the number of positions. I just want to point out nothing in the Siegel study led to an idea that we might be able to reduce positions. Right. What they suggested is we might be able to avoid adding some positions if right. we can improve our. Um, Sorry, I'll rephrase that. Uh, I didn't mean it exactly. Yeah, again, it's, it's uh, no, it's about efficiencies. It's about, uh, you know, um, lessening the duplication, ensuring there's redundancy, you know, as we move forward. Um, really good job from all. Uh, Roberta, Tim, anything? No? Okay. 
Again, Scott, Rebecca, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time and continue to look forward to uh, the dialogue. Thank you again. It was an honor to, to work with all of you. And, uh, you know, any questions you have about our work, uh, we're always uh, available and ready to, to meet with you uh, collectively, individually. Um, and I just say, say one last thing. Don't beat yourself up too much about not doing this three years ago. Uh, a lot of these challenges were, um, were brought to light and exacerbated by the pandemic. Correct. Good point. Um, and so um, while some of them were brewing beforehand, right. that bearing was starting to go out uh, before the pandemic. Yep. But it, uh, the pandemic really brought it to light. Yep, the environment had a vote. So, yep, That's true. I appreciate that. Okay, from that very informative briefing, let's talk about the landfill tonnage, FY23 budget. Mm -hmm. Remember, yeah. I recommended nice. annual landfilling tonnage for FY23 budget. Commissioner Williams gets to blame for anything like that. He, 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 we blame him for everything? We blame him for everything. Yeah, well, you know. You? You. Oh. Wait, what? Come on up. I didn't know Ted was leaving just now. Eh, if Ted wants to stick around. Yes, You're the next good. contestant. Next, that's one of the parties is right. Okay. Go ahead, Cliff. What's on your mind? Well, Commissioners, good morning, and thank you very much for, uh, for having us in today. Uh, we're here this morning to ask for some guidance on two items as we finalize our recommended Fiscal 23 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget. Uh, as you may recall, during the Fiscal 22 budget deliberations, uh, the board considered two specific changes uh, at Northern Landfill. Those, those changes would have been increasing the recycling tip fee from the current $30 per ton uh, to $55 per ton on July 1st this year, 2022. Uh, and second was to increase landfill tonnage to 55,000 tons. We had a pretty in-depth discussion about that last year. Ultimately, the board approved the recycling tip fee increase to be effective July 1st, 2022, and we are on a tra trajectory to do that. But they pushed off the disposal tonnage increase one year, pending other ongoing initiatives. Uh, basically, those discussions all occurred before we purchased you know, the neighboring property uh, adjacent to the landfill. So currently, DPW, along with budget staff, are finalizing our recommended 23 uh, enterprise fund budget. So we respectfully request board guidance uh, on these two following items. The first is regarding the recycling tip fee. Uh, does the board still desire to increase the recycling tip fee to $55 a ton uh, on July 1st of 2022? And the second would be regarding the annual landfill tons, just as the situation was last year, staff recommends not increasing the landfill tonnage to 55,000 tons in the budget uh, for various reasons we can go over most of them but the biggest one is the schedule for the master plan uh, is four years uh, or I'm sorry this, if we did the 55,000 ton we'd be out of room in cell four or cell three we would need cell four and the transfer station built and operational in four years and we have a five to seven year window uh, with regard to the master plan uh, so that is the biggest crux uh, or issue with that. Uh, we want to thank you for, for your time, and we can address any questions or comments that you may have. Hey, just a couple follow-up there, things as you as you start to think about this. You know, one the the operating plan as it exists is built on those two decisions being in, in place. So when we talk about the uh, the increase in the recycling tipping fee, we've we've assumed that in the numbers. And when we talk about uh, increasing the amount going into the landfill and reducing the amount going to transfer, that is built into the, um, the operating plan. Now, on Cliff's point about is it actually viable for us to increase the landfilling to the point that we have built the plan on right, right now, I think that's a, a, a really important point. Um, I'm with him on his concern about this. You know, is this is this doable? So you have two different decisions, though. One is, does the recycling tip fee change stay in place? And the other is, uh, are we going to change how we're landfilling? And on that one, that doesn't have to be a yes or or a no. We could go back to where we were. Uh, we could do what you built into the plan, although we're saying that's probably a problem or we could go somewhere in between those. Now every, every time we increase the amount of, land, of landfilling we're doing, we're decreasing the life and taking us closer to Cliff's concern. 
Uh, every time we increase the transfer, we're also increasing an expenditure that's not built into our plan. So with, with this whole thing, uh, I mean, if you're gonna consider changes, we have to consider what does this do to landfill life? What does this do to our costs? And how does that affect the bottom line? Thank you. Cliff, on your thing here, you have uh, the, the processing cost has decreased of $98 a ton to $36 a ton for recyclables. Correct. Is it, and the, this based on January's numbers. Okay, but that, and, but you also added to that the fifty-six sixty-five a ton for hauling and processing. Is that correct? That's correct, and that okay. that's generally consistent. It increases a dollar or so every year because of cost of Okay, so, and, and my question would be, why would we decrease the increase? Because we're still we're still not even meeting what it costs us to process that. Uh, understood. Uh, the, the rates in the general region are 30, maybe maxing out at $35 a ton. So it does put us above the regional rate. But however, like you said, uh, it would not cover anywhere near the total amount, but right. at least would cover one. It, again, it, it's being brought up to, again, guidance for us to prepare the budget and just to give the board one last opportunity to uh, consider which way to go on it. And how many tons a year are we landfilling right now? Uh, from the landfill side or we're on the recycling no on the landfill side, landfill right side the second um, question <laughs> this budget season fiscal 22 we were budgeted the landfill 12,500 tons we can do a lot more than that but the 55 is an issue from okay. the schedule standpoint if I'm, so in order to get to the five to seven year plan that we that the master plan has what is the tonnage that we would put in that we would landfill each year and and put us at let's say the seven year mark instead of four yeah, considering that when we do this analysis we also try to retain some tonnage for storm debris mm -hmm. you know event natural uh, natural disaster events like that uh somewhere in the vicinity of 25 to 27 thousand tons a year is a good in, in my opinion is a good comfort zone okay so 27,000 tons a year we still have seven years to get everything else in place we have a little more than that but that allows for things to happen right gotcha Thank you for that question. Thank you. And you're very welcome. No, was, and that, that would save us money, excellent, right? Excellent. Since we're not transferring. Yeah, out. we would have an incremental benefit. Yeah, because we would, we would be transferring less, so we would have less transfer costs. It's certainly not going to cover all of it, but it's it would make it less expensive to deal than if we were just landfilling for mm -hmm. And just on the tip, you know, there's the cost side. There's also the, the risk side here. And I just I don't want to make I want to make sure we don't lose that now, right now we don't know we don't even know that we can open another landfill yeah I mean beyond cell four uh, so if we we bank our thinking on how long this landfill will last but we don't get another landfill then we, we still have a problem and that's and that's not me arguing what you ought to do here I just need what to make sure we're weighing with. that so, so my concern is we based our five-year budget on this fifty-five dollars a ton. Fifty-five thousand tons. I mean, fifty-five thousand. On both, on both actually. Right. Both numbers are fifty-five. Oh. Well, we 55. also based our we 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 also the fifty-five dollars a ton is the one that I'm kind of looking at. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm kind of looking at that, one, uh, which kind of helped us see what. The out years, as we always do with everything, would look like. And I'm concerned if we make a if we make a change now on that part of it, that it could be a huge negative effect. I am, however, based on your question, thinking that we could back off of that 55,000 tons per year. Mm -hmm. I think that probably right. would be something we could do. But I'm hesitant right now to do anything since it's the first week of March, that would have either a negative, well, it would have a negative effect on our budget. I, I, I think we're too close. We're talking about 523. 20 I understand that, but on, on the, the future, on the budget in general, and when we, for the, for the per ton rate is what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, the two pieces have two different timelines. And, well, and I know that, can, right. Cliff can talk more about this th than I can but if if the recycling tipping fee is going to remain in place you pretty much need to be 
acting to notify people now. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. And right. since it was approved last right. year, it already went through public hearing. We're past right. that schedule. Right. Now it's just a matter of notifying the haulers. Yeah. Now on the other piece, how much are we going to landfill? That is not as urgent an issue, and we can run through scenarios with you. Sure. Do we have any um, understanding of the engineering of the new property as far as its uh, ability to create you know, more of a landfill capacity? I mean, have we We're done? The, the last uh, yeah. update that I gave to the board here probably a month or so ago, Right. Uh, what's being done is, or is the field surveying at this right. point um, and finalizing the RFP to go out for the master plan, which should be out in a week or two okay. uh, out of the Northeast Authority. So okay. do we have a better idea? Not really. Yeah. Um, no, no, I, I get it. I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that refreshing me. Thanks. And the follow-up to that question would be, based on what the state says about opening new landfills. Say or may not say, correct. Say or whatever, what it, right. however they, however the wind blows. Uh, would it be considered a new landfill if we have the property now to add new cells? Or does that remain, this is your landfill and you can kind of do what you want with it? The only way that I can answer that is to look back at the last time a moratorium was put in place, which was under Governor O'Malley. And if you had an application in place already submitted to the state, which the very first phase is pretty simple document, yeah. then you're in line and you would not okay. have been you know, kicked out of line. So our goal is we're going to presume that's maybe the, what's going to come down again. We want to get that first piece in so we reserve our place in line. Okay. Uh, and But again, anything can change. Well, right. 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 No, but that's good. Yeah, yeah but if it's already there, I yeah. would argue that we're just – Tweaking. Or speaking. No, we don't <laughs> speak. <laughs> and we don't tweak. I appreciate that. Yes, we, we would tweak. No, I mean, <laughs> okay. No, I, I do it because that, that, you know, the precedent had been set. Mm -hmm. So the expectation is that it would remain, you know, uh, there is risk associated with it, but that's the expectation. Absolutely. So I appreciate and it. What, what part uh, are you talking about would remain? Being yeah. in line. Being oh, yeah. 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 Okay. And, and, to the, right. and to the best of my knowledge, there isn't a draft legislation that's addressing that now. I mean, when O'Malley did it, it was an executive order. So anything is possible. That guy. Right. Okay. Oh. So what do you want from us today? Well, uh, the first is uh, whether, we, well, whether we decide to, continue to leave in place the $55 a ton recycling uh, fee. And then that really, I don't know that that needs a, an up or down vote. No, that's I think we just have to confirm that that's what we want to do. And because we already made a motion on that to put it into effect, and my suggestion, keep it in effect. I'll have to reiterate that. And the reason I want to is I think the recycle market is extremely volatile, and I'd hate to see us modify it and then half a year away or a year away, we're back to where we were before, and then we're jumping back and forth. So I do like the consistency, as Commissioner Frazier said, that the holder course that's already in place is structurally implemented in our budget. And I like the idea of your staff and discretion finding a happy medium on the tonnage that we're going to put in our landfill based upon the timeline of the future expansion. So what do we need? Because my suggestion again, change the tonnage from 55,000 tons to 27,000 tons a year. That way it gives us a timeline to stretch it out and get other things in place that we that you're saying that we need to do. So my guess is we need a motion to change the tonnage that we're going to landfill um, from 55,000 tons a year to 27,000 tons a year. So I would make that motion. Do we need a motion for that? Or yeah, because it's a change. Push. And then I'll yeah. second that. No, that makes it 27 as it is, or 27 additional thousand? No, no, 27 no, no, no. altogether. Vol, vol, annual 55 volume. 55 right? to, to 27. 27, 5 Ooh. or 27? 27,000. Oh, <laughs> Not 27,001, just 27,000. Okay. Right. I got a motion, I got a second. We understand what this is. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, now let's talk about uh, 2022 pipe culvert repairs That's gonna be a tough one. and replacements. Good morning. Good morning. The Office of Procurement and 
cooperation with the Bureau of Engineering request your approval to award the contract for the pipe culvert repair and replacement to Stan Balls Incorporated in the amount of $774,127. This work consists of repair and replacement of pipe culverts on 20 county roads. The Office of Procurement uh, advertised for an invitation for bid. Uh, we received six responses, which are listed on the briefing paper below. Stan Balls did come in at the lowest bid. And we are requesting your approval with, uh, in the, it's in with, within the adopted budget. No additional fund will be necessary. Thank you. Um, this work is necessary to make repairs, replacements, and installations of new pipes prior to our pavement and preservation projects where we mill and overlay and reclaim some of our roadways. As was noted, there's 20 roadways with 39 different sites along those roadways. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing pipe replacements, new pipes to address uh, issues or property owner concerns, end walls, inlets, stream maintenance, maintenance of traffic, and roadway patching before we can come and make final repairs. Um, we're very familiar with Stan Balls. They've uh, performed this work for us in the past, and they anticipate getting started as soon as the weather permits. I'll make the motion the Board of Commissioners award the contract for 2022 Pike Culvert Repairs slash Replacement to Stan Balls, Inc. in the amount of $774,127. Second. Second. I got a motion in a couple of seconds. Any further discussion on this? I do have a question. There's one of the bids that has a number, but also has not responsive. How is, if they gave us a bid, how is it not responsive? They were not pre-qualified to perform this work. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wish everything was that easy. Okay, let's talk about the 2023 Consolidated Transportation Plan Priority Letter. Are you guys all be more difficult than them? Nope. And this oh, is... I don't know. Mary's making promises. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> the letter to go to the newly Secretary of the Honorable James Port. Go for it. Okay. You have this in front of you in your packets? Yes, This marked up letter? Okay. Then I'll just work from this. Um, what this is, <clears throat> is last year's letter. Everything in highlighted is new language for this year. Okay. Um, Including the Secretary. Yes. Yes. Well, there's a lot of things. So yeah. <laughs> if I missed anything, let us know. Um, but this came from our discussion with you last month, mm -hmm. um, where you gave us direction on the changes to last year. As you'll recall from the last few <clears> years, some of you more than that, we do keep to the same structure of the letter typically, and we just make the changes from there. So I'll just go page by page. Um, on the first page, those are pretty much just technical changes, things we're thanking them for that happened this year, mm -hmm. um, and changes in dates and names. Um, on the second page, there's something a little bit more significant. You switch the priorities. The um, first priority is now Maryland 97 for years that had been the second priority, but we switched that so that has been changed to the highest priority um, with the same breakout project, asking for a feasibility study and the purchase of right of way is very important. Um, so now the second priority is Maryland 32 from 26 to the Carroll County line. The only change made there is the notation regarding um, Warfield at Historic Sykesville and the recent um, tax credit mm -hmm. that so was given. So the reason for the breakout as one of the priorities for um, Project for 97 is we need that as our first step to get into what they call Chapter 30 submission, and that's where the funding ends up coming from okay. is those Chapter 30. So that's why I wanted to let you know if you're thinking, why are we not doing something else? It's because we need that Chapter 30 submission yeah. to go to the next step from the state. Correct. Okay. So um, I'm going to move on to page three. There are really no changes other than there was a newly adopted mm -hmm. Town of Sykesville Master Plan. That date has been changed. But again, the breakout projects are the same for the Maryland 32. Those came out of the Pell study from about four years ago, and those remain, remain the same. Um, the third priority remains Maryland 26 from 32 to the reservoir. Um, there is no new language. The breakout project for that remains um, converting eastbound Maryland 26 right turn only lane at Georgetown Boulevard, and that came out of the 2020 SHA um, corridor study that was presented to you, I believe, mm -hmm. July of 2020. 
And with that, they have done a lot of work giving us, that corridor study was part of the discussion. Um, they provided us with an access management plan that we'll be utilizing as new projects come forward on the Maryland 26 corridor. So even though physical things haven't been done, there's been a lot of background work and movement forward and getting the plans prepared so that when things do get ready to move forward with any construction, we're all in agreement. Okay. So the fourth priority remains Maryland 140 corridor improvements, and there is a breakout project for which there has been progress. Um, so I noted that we're pleased that it has received design funding for the jug handle, mm -hmm. and we look forward to the ultimate construction. So um, you'll recall we added a new fifth priority, which is the Maryland 27 corridor improvements from the Carroll County line to Lyshear Road. Um, I do have maps. There was a request for a map if anybody would like a map. I didn't include it in the packet. I don't believe I included it, but oh, I mean, I think we're yeah, good. I saw it before. I don't need to see it. Yeah, but you, yeah, I mean, I'm going to pass make sure we're, we're good. Else. Okay. Well, it's okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. And this write up pretty much came from the town of Mount Airy's request letter as well as Thanks. their corridor study from a few years ago. Um, there's Thank nothing you. too specific in it at this yeah. point, but it is pointed out that as we move forward with it, breakout projects will be identified and prioritized. There's mm -hmm. a number of them identified in Mount Airy's quarter study, but it really is too early at this point with um, the different developments that are under discussion to know what the priority sure. would be. So does anybody want to make any changes to that language since it's all new, or is that language okay? Okay. Um, I am now on page five with the two urban reconstruction called streetscape projects. The first one is in Sykesville, and um, we're pointing out that this year there has been progress made. That the county is working on the uh, water and sewer upgrades, and um, we also pointed out that um, the town of Sykesville is advancing engineering efforts for several other adjacent pro projects to build off of the planned urban reconstruction. These efforts include parking upgrades, expanded sidewalk and pedestrian facilities, and improved multimodal connectivity. Mm -hmm. And also we talk about the bridge, I believe. Yes, the next highest priority is the existing bridge over the South Branch yeah. Patapsco River. And that was something the mayor felt strongly about to have included in the letter, yeah. so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Because, I mean, it's, it's actually in Howard County, that bridge. Okay. Um, so it's it's got to be a partnership yep. between Howard County and Carroll. So the second streetscape, which has been in the letter for a number of years, is New Windsor. Um, again, there's been progress made in this, and we talked about this when we were here last month, that um, New Windsor has 95% water main improvement plans and specifications complete, and they are making progress in discussions with SHA. So that um, language has been added. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, also on page six, regarding transit projects, that's new language, but it's reflecting the language that's always been in there, and it's reflecting what's provided to us um, by Public Works that you've also approved for the transportation plan. Um, there are no changes to the bike, pedestrian, trail projects. The Westminster Community Trail hasn't had any updates, and the Governor Frank Brown Trail is still waiting for um, progress based on the security issues at the Readiness Center. Um, we continue to point out three other issues. The um, Maryland 140 Sullivan to Market is also a priority of yours. Maryland 31 at Medford for safety concerns, study for safety concerns, as well as Maryland 26 at Johnsville Road, again, safety concerns. Um, the new highlighted language at the bottom of page seven was provided to us by the Department of Public Works. They would like that added, the first paragraph at least, that's their language. So we took that, uh, we brought that to you last month and you agreed to put that in. The rest of the new highlighted language on pages seven and eight was what we discussed with you that came from the, um, from BMC. All the jurisdictions are inserting this language into their priority letters. We have talked to them. I'm not sure if it's identical language. This was the language that was provided to us, and so we inserted it in as written. It basically references the corridors and projects that are in the Baltimore regional area. 
and this is a show of unity and um, cooperation among the jurisdictions. But at the bottom, we do note the two projects that we consider interjurisdictional and important, which is Maryland 140 through Westminster, as well as 32 to 26 in the Sykesville area. Okay. And those are the changes, as well as a few names. And um, if you're in agreement, we can um, any uh, take the highlighting out. Then <laughs> any edits, changes that want to be made? I think I really appreciate the responsiveness and the and the, and the work you all did in doing this. Okay. Do I need a motion to uh, approve? I move we agree? approve the. Uh, Transportation road. Consolidated transportation road. Second. Okay, I got a motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank so you. we'll work with Mike Fowler to get signatures then as our practice has been at the delegation and send it off after we receive your signatures as well. Sounds great. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Right. Thank this you. reminds me when I was a kid. Appreciate the map. Christmas list. I need a. It is a Christmas list. I need a yeah, review yeah. of the summary of closed minutes from February 17th on. What was the topic? Just, uh, um, land, land acquisition. Next one was pretty easy. Uh, motion to approve those minutes. Second. second. Okay, I got a motion. I got a couple of seconds. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Do I have, uh, Chris, do we have any callers? No callers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything for open admin at this point? Yeah, one thing real quick. I forgot in Priority Carol. I don't know how many folks are still listening, but this Saturday from 9 to 12 at Westminster High School is the uh, Celebrating America History Day Expo. That's been kind of forgotten in the pandemic mm -hmm, world, yeah. but they're trying to get it back now. So it goes from 9 to 12 in the lobby at Westminster High School. I actually was a judge this year for one of the categories. <laughs> uh, so was Vivian Daly. Uh, she had one category, I had the other, and uh, had a good time looking at, the, again, some bright young people who put some remarkable uh, uh, programs in front of us. So if you get a chance, 9 to 12 Saturday, uh, hit Westminster High School uh, to see uh, some really great exhibits. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. Ed. Absolutely. Anything else for open admin? Roberta? Just um, quickly, each year we have to appoint a tax collector. Earlier in the year we appointed Rob Burke, and now we know he's you know, not going to be with the county much longer, so um, we would like to appoint Jennifer Hobbs, and I have a letter for you guys to sign okay. um, in, that, in that capacity. Yep. So you know. Wanda, why don't you come on up? Make a note, I want a Weaver for that position. But. Tax yeah. No, not yeah. as a tax collector. Huh? We want to weaver for tax collector. For tax collector? Yeah, we think we should be electing that position. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's holding his tongue right now. <laughs> some places they are elected. Uh, yeah. In some, in state of Florida, for example, the, the tax collector is a separately elected individual. Yeah, yeah, I think they do that in PA in some areas too. Maybe. Don't they get tarred and feathered? I, mean, <laughs> I would think. Who would want to run for that position? But anyway. <laughs> Kind of like the sergeant of arms at the uh, Capitol when uh, Congress, a congressman was uh, drunken at the bar. Their role was to get him out of the bar and get him into their seat, <laughs> you know, back in the day. The other job was to keep the uh, Capitol warm with firewood. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, March 7th, we have nothing scheduled. On Tuesday, March 8th, it starts. We have the FY23 <laughs> budget starts. overview. It. It. At 4.30, rising uh, with Boys and Girls Club at Winters Mill. Commissioner Frazier uh, is scheduled to attend. I am tentatively uh, attend attending that as well. We'll see. And then I have an Ag Board meeting on 7 p.m. on Tuesday, March 8th. Wednesday, March 9th, I'm attending the Governor's Workforce Development Board. It's still and virtual. I have a Board of Ed that night, I think, at 5. Okay. And yeah, you have a Board of Ed <laughs> that evening. You enjoy that. And I don't Thursday. Know if it's worth noting, but on the 9th, we'll be, I'll be in Annapolis, too. 
testifying. Okay. Testifying uh, in okay. Senate chambers. Representing Carroll County. I, I'll do it well. I'm sure you will. Or try. Thursday, we have open session. I, let's see. Approve submission of an FY23 Community Partnership Agreement and accept the award. Uh, Ms. Steckel will be presenting or uh, you know, in attendance. And then we have application and accept the award for uh, Developmental Disabilities and Administration, DDA, American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, we will have public comment on noise ordinance. Did you hear that, Mr. Burke? Actually, we're going to uh, present to you a, a, an alternative for a possible noise ordinance to see if you would be interested in pursuing it and proceeding to the public process. Okay. I hear you. I'm looking forward to that. What did you say? No. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we have CDL training at the Carroll Community College and Workforce Development Board. Uh, Mr. Lyburn, I think, is going to talk about the program between Workforce Development and Carroll Community College on CDL. No, I'm training. I was going to say, I already have my CDL. Yeah, so I was, I I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confused on what that to topic to is. What are we procuring? Okay, got it. Westminster Town County Agreement. Mr. Zaleski will be presenting. And then a project Im project implementation team update. Okay, not really sure what that is. That's the next phase of the Siegel study. Um, Ted referred to it, that, that staff's coming back to say, you know, here's Here's where we stand, and it's the first of what will be a series of conversations about what you heard today. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. And then I some follow-up discussion from, I guess, the Siegel study as well. Is that what that is? <laughs> I'm usually not this confused. I'm, I'm confused many times, but this confused, I'm kind of... Okay. Have you done this before? Yeah, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> and then uh, Friday, March 11, got nothing. Let's let me just keep going. I am looking forward to the Girl Scout Gold Award and the Free Little Pantry, which will be held at Eldersburg Library uh, on Saturday morning, 10 a.m. And Commissioner Weaver will have the podcast on Sunday, March 13th. Yay, Weaver! Make sure you turn your clocks up on the 13th so you don't miss Weaver. That would be tragic. <laughs> we want to do that. So we spring forward on March 12th, is what you're saying, or March 13th. Yeah. We spring forward. We spring forward. We spring forward. All right. That's how I remember. Spring forward, fall back. That's okay. Right. Monday 14th, we got nothing. Tuesday, March 15th, we got the local management board, uh, Commissioner Frazier attending, planning commission. It'll be hybrid, virtual, and in person. Commissioner Wance will be attending. Uh, Commissioner Weaver and I will be attending the Veterans Advisory meeting at 2 p.m. And then Battle of the Books, Commissioner Boucher will be uh, attending in Westminster. I would think I'm attending the Westminster one. I know I said I would be, be going to the Westminster one. What location one. is it? Do you know? Usually the high school. Okay. But check, I, I know I said I would go to the Battle of the Books. Okay. There's two of them in Westminster High School. I, I said I would be at both of them. Okay. It just let me know the exact location because what I did before wound up being an elementary school in Mount Area, so I know where. They usually have them next door. Yeah. I think this one is the one for adults. This isn't no, the children. The, the one for adults is being held at 1623. Well, I know, but that's March 15th. <laughs> it's March 15th. Well, let's check on that. Yeah. Because we'll I, I, I remember seeing the, the, I the information I got, and I said I would go to the two that were I held at Westminster High School. I apologize for anybody listening, and the confusion okay. that is occurring. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to check on that. <laughs> Welcome there, <laughs> world. I can't read. Okay. <laughs> okay. Until rudely interrupted by Commissioner Fraser, I'll continue with Thursday, March 17th. When is uh, St. Patrick's Day? Uh, St. Patrick's Day. Okay, St. Patrick's Day. Okay. It's a date night. 
You gotta come to work on that. Oh, that's thing. right. It, yeah, we'll talk about that too. Uh, there'll be a proclamation <laughs> transit driver appreciation <laughs> day. Um, and Stacy Nash will be participating in that. Uh, request approval to submit FY23 adult court grant. And request approval to submit FY23 macro conflict resolution grant application. So Judge Hecker will be with us for a couple of events and then uh, approve an acceptance of FY23 annual transportation plan. Maryland Municipal League that evening. Uh, I know I'll be attending and I believe Commissioner Weaver will be attending. I will be attending. I, Commissioner Fraser will be attending. I know everybody to that as well. Do I have anybody else? Yeah, I'm probably, well, I don't know yet. It's St. Patrick's night, so I'm not sure yet. I, I'm listed to go. So. Okay. Commissioner Boucher, are you attending Yes, that? I believe I've committed to that. Okay. So if we can check, that sounds like all of us will be attending down in Manchester, up in Manchester. Friday, we have nothing. Saturday, March 19th, Grayson Gardner Eagle Scout Ceremony. Commissioner Frazier will be participating at Sandy Mount United Methodist Church. And then Commissioner Frazier may talk about that during his podcast the next day. Good possibility. What's that? Good possibility. Good possibility. It is a good possibility. I've, okay. I pulled up the Battle of the Books, and they don't start until April the 1st. Yeah, I think this has to be the book. Okay. I don't think it's the book. All right. All right. Then, then I didn't say I was going to get to that one. <laughs> so you pulled it up while instead of listening to me? That's correct. Okay. I'm just using, you know. Yeah. Okay. Juan, did I miss anything? No. Okay. Yeah. Although I'm very confused about it. Mr. Burke, did I miss anything? Okay. Okay. What I need now is a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> second. I got a motion. I got a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Opposed. So we got one. Everything goes the same. What's that? What? 4-1.